let me welcome you all to the Non-Tariff Measures Week, Trade Regulations and Voluntary Sustainability Standards. My name is Bonapas Onguglo. I am uh, the head of the Trade Analysis Branch in the Division on International Trade and, and Commodities. And um, this week, I, w I will I would like to, uh, we will be talking at the issues of non-tariff measures and voluntary sustainability standards, reg regulations and non-regulatory measures that have a prominent role in international trade. They are increasingly used for trade and non-trade objectives affecting society, the environment, and the economy. We are hosting this fourth non-tariff measures week. This is the fourth. It's the fourth one because we, we, we see that while tariffs has been, um, have been discussed heavily and intensively in the last few days, but uh, including in the past, the non-tariff measures and, and technical standards, voluntary sustainability standards, uh, do not tend to have a, um, uh, sufficient focus and attention. So we try to bring this to the attention of the global community and at the local and national level as well because they are very important in terms of shaping international trade and affecting the flow of goods and services across and towards the border and behind the border. So uh, this week we will be looking, there are, there are three parts to our agenda. If you have your uh, agenda and there are copies on the tab table here, you will see that there are three parts to the agenda. We will begin with a policy debate on the role of trade regulation after an opening by our director we will begin with a policy debate on the role of trade regulation and voluntary sustainability standards. That's this morning. Then we will go to the second part of our agenda, which is looking at non-tariff measures, regulations to be complied with. Um, and these are regulations like TBT, SPS, rules of origin, those regulations that are set by governments and which need to be complied with by exporters in trading. So we will look at, that's the part two of our agenda which starts from this afternoon and goes until Wednesday and then on Thursday we'll look at the uh, third part of our work which will be looking at s voluntary sustainability standards that also which are not regulations they are non-regulatory they are set by private sector uh, private parties and they affect also the production of goods and services in terms of meeting sustainability goals. So this we will take up on Thursday, whole day on Thursday. And then we will conclude at the end with, um, with a closing session in which we'll highlight some of the key stories and key challenges and key policy messages that, uh, that have arisen during this discussion. So now um, I, would like us, I would like to introduce uh, our, uh, our opening speaker. It is really my pleasure and honor to introduce Ms. Pamela Cook Hamilton, the Director of the Division of International Trade and Commodities. She, uh, she was recently appointed to the post by the Secretary General of UNCTAD, and um, she's in the office for four weeks now. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Cook Hamilton, um, uh, before taking up this position, she was uh, Executive Director of the Caribbean Export Development Agency and brings uh, deep and extensive knowledge in international trade, trade policy, and private sector development. So I think this cuts across this, or the, the, the topics we are dealing with today, uh, which affect both policymakers and private sector. So she will provide, uh, provide us with some insights on non-tariff measures, voluntary sustainability standards, and the sustainable development goals. So Pamela, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Bonapas. Good morning, everybody. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for the opportunity to be here and to open this non-tariff measures week. Um, I think this is a critical issue that we are happy to be leading on. And uh, we wanted to talk, the topic today is trade regulations and voluntary sustainability standards. Um, while everyone focuses on the tariff wars taking place, the hidden barriers presented through non-tariff measures continue to affect exports in myriad ways and block the actual exports and market penetration of developing countries. And I think that's why this is a critical issue to discuss because while everybody talks about the number of tariff levels going up, nobody's talking about the non-tariff measures which are actually uh, more elusive and more difficult to engage. One of the main features of the international 
cooperation agenda during the last 50 years has been to promote economic integration of developing countries into the global economy, helping them to eradicate poverty and achieve prosperity. This proposition at the core of the UNCTAD mandate has been forcefully reinstated in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and in the Sustainable Development Goals. Sustainable Development Goal 17 calls for the strengthening of the means of implementation for sustainable development, including through enhancing the equitable participation of developing countries, especially the least developed countries, the LDCs, into the international trading arena. Many of the SDGs from 1 to 16 underline the important role of trade in catalyzing sustainable development. The rationale is that stronger integration into the global economy through trade as well as technology and finance will enhance economic growth, reduce poverty, and ultimately develop the resources needed for sustainable and inclusive prosperity. So economic integration has been an integral part of the development agenda for several decades. However, many developing countries still struggle today to integrate into international markets. One problem is that contemporary economic integration strategies need to confront policy measures that are well beyond the scope of traditional trade policy, especially tariffs. For example, developing countries' effective participation in world markets depends on their capacity to produce products for exports that satisfy technical and quality standards, as well as to comply with burdensome, costly, and time-consuming administrative procedures. As someone from a small island developing state, I can speak very directly to the consequences of having to deal with non-tariff measures and the barriers that they place on countries trying to export to developed country markets. All these policy measures, generally referred to as non-tariff measures, have a profound impact on the structure of global trade and participation of countries therein. NTMs are an elusive, often opaque class of trade measures that are pervasive and increasing use across countries and sectors and encompass a wide variety of governmental and thus mandatory measures from import licensing to technical regulations and pro from procurement preferences to subsidies. I also wanted to make the point that during uh, one of the assessments done in, in Jamaica, it was found that 93% of the barriers uh, to export were actually internal to Jamaica. <laughs> they were not external. They actually occurred before you left the border. And therefore, that's another issue. Are there internal non-tariff measures within country that are affecting their ability to export? Non-tariff measures comprise a key area of international trade negotiations and confrontation in regional and multilateral trade agreements. Therefore, it is crucial for governments to be fully aware of the implications and the effect of such measures on trade and their domestic economies. More importantly, we need to remember that while current trade disputes are being fought by rounds of retaliatory tariffs, such disputes reflect disagreements in the areas of intellectual property rights, government subsidies, and many other regulatory measures affecting market access and the beneficial integration of countries in global trade. An informed discussion that we're going to be having here on non-tariff measures is therefore of extreme importance and more so in the present circumstances. Voluntary sustainability standards comprise a part of the non-tariff measures affecting trade. Increasingly, exports need to comply with certain standards that are encouraged if not imposed by global value chains. Meeting sustainability standards of which there are around 400 to 500 today has become a prerequisite for some producers to participate in global value chains of consumer goods, such as in the food, cosmetics, clothing, or furniture industries. These sustainability standards, which are at times referred to as private standards, pose further challenges, particularly to smallholder producers in developing countries. In UNCTAD, we stand by the principle that good policy needs to be informed by research, analysis, and data. During the last two decades, UNCTAD has been supporting developing countries in the area of non-tariff measures by providing them with information, analysis, and tools to take informed decisions in formulating policy or in addressing NTMs in bilateral, regional, and multilateral trade negotiations. We have the largest and most comprehensive database on NTMs, covering 109 countries and 90% of world trade, which we make available publicly for all to use. However, our work in this area is far from being complete. Non-tariff measures are becoming a priority in the policy agenda of many developed and developing countries. There is rising concern that existing international trade rules 
many of which relate to non-tariff measures, are insufficient to address the trade concerns of the 21st century. Moreover, there's a trend towards trade policies that are more attentive to national socioeconomic outcomes. There's a need to continuously review, rethink, and renew our work on national, on uh, sorry, non-tariff measures. Further, increasing use of private standards for meeting sustainability goals for social, economic, and environmental, and even human rights are becoming prevalent. A discussion on their impact on trade, consumption, and production is also necessary. We are contributing through our technical assistance projects in partnership with several UN agencies <coughs> under the UN Forum on Voluntary Sustainability Standards to support national, multi-stakeholder platforms to address these issues from the perspective of their SMEs and their consumers. The NTM Week is an event where policymakers, technical experts, and researchers working on this very complex area gather to exchange views and ideas. We wish to advance the policy dialogue by providing information, ideas, and a platform for substantive discussion. It is also an arena to showcase concrete outputs of the interagency partnership on improving transparency and better understanding on non-tariff measures and private sustainability standards. I want to thank you for coming this morning. I look forward to the substantive debate, the discussion on the issues, and hopefully we can emerge with a greater understanding of the issues facing developing countries and uh, non-tariff measures in general. I wish you a fruitful meeting. Thank you very much. Having made the opening remarks, I want to welcome our panelists this morning. The policy debate is the trade regulations, the role of trade regulations and voluntary standards for sustainable development. And this session is going to examine the potential of trade regulations and voluntary standards as powerful tools in the achievement of sustainable development. Uh, on our panel today, um, unfortunately, uh, His Excellency Mr. Didier Chambovi, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the WTO, as well as Mr. Paolo Garzotti, Deputy Permanent Representative of the European Union to the WTO, uh, were unable to make it as they were called away to a meeting um, urgently this morning. So on our panel, we, we still have a very strong panel with Her Excellency Ms. Meru Alassi Falemeka. Am I pronouncing it right? Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador and permanent representative of the Pacific Islands Forum to the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and other international organizations. His Excellency Mr. Alejandro de la Peña Navarrete, Secretary General, Latin American Integration Association. Thank you for coming. Mr. Viwanu Nasunu, Assistant Secretary General, African Caribbean and Pacific Group of States. And we apologize that you were held at security. Um, <laughs> Ms. Natalie Bernasconi Osterwalder. Executive Director, International Institute of Sustainable Development. Thank you for coming. So what we want to do, I'd like to start with uh, Her Excellency Ms. Falameka to make a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Madam uh, uh, Director of the Division of International Trade and Commodities of ANCAT. Uh, let me, first of all, on behalf of the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, thank um, UNCTAD for organizing this uh, uh, Non-Tariff Measures Week, <coughs> an issue that is um, very important for us uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and I'm very honored to be part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Um, <coughs> the um, Pacific Islands Forum consists of 18 members. Uh, we have two developed members, Australia and New Zealand, two territories, and 14 independent small island states. So I will speak mainly from the perspective of the 14 independent uh, small island uh, states. Um, <coughs> and of the 14, um, four are LDCs, uh, and also of the 14, six are World Trade Organization members, and eight are non-WTO members. <coughs> I say this because for the non-WTO members, many uh, are really not familiar with this issue of NTMs, and, but have recognized the importance uh, of NTMs. <coughs> My uh, um, statement this morning will basically 
um, uh, share the experience of the, of the region, the Pacific Islands region, and also um, where we are in terms of the uh, development of uh, um, uh, policies and legislation relating to, um, to address NTMs, what the region is doing, uh, and then perhaps looking ahead to um, uh, make some comments on the uh, um, uh, regulatory collaboration and also on voluntary sustainability standards. So first of all, in terms of where we are in the region, <coughs> the Pacific Island countries currently enjoy uh, market access through a number of preferential trade arrangements that we have with Australia and New Zealand, with the EU through the uh, uh, Interim Economic Partnership Agreement and also with the Everything But Arms uh, Agreement and also through the generalized system of preferences which some of our members are, are exporting under. However, many Pacific Island countries are unable to take effective advantage of these pre trade preferences due to non-tariff measures. The Pacific Island countries have long recognized the importance of NTMs as one of the greatest obstacles to market access. Um, this, of course, adds to the challenges that we already have in our region, the problems of isolation, of uh, smallness, um, which lead to high trade costs. So NTMs also add, um, uh, exacerbate the ability of Pacific Island countries to access um, uh, markets and even to take advantage of the market access that we currently enjoy under <coughs> various preferential trade arrangements. However, our first lesson in NTMs came in 2000 with the ban on the imports of kava, kava, a, um, a Pacific uh, traditional drink or um, a plant uh, that, was, uh, that, that was exported to Europe. <coughs> That ban on um, imports uh, into the European market um, provided a wake-up call. And <coughs> that ban cost the region around 200, US dollars, 200 million US dollars annually in export earnings. And this was an important crop because it had far-reaching effects on our communities, on our rural, uh, on our farmers, on our rural sector, uh, on our uh, um, uh, island communities uh, because they were able to plant this uh, crop. Uh, and this was only found uh, in the region. And there were four countries in our region, uh, Vanuatu, uh, Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, that were the main producers of uh, kava. And they were exporting successfully to Europe. And kava is a, a natural sedative, uh, was used, was imported into Europe to be used in nutraceutical um, uh, products, uh, supplements. Um, so when the ban came um, for the standards reasons, uh, um, it was um, a, 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 a difficult um, uh, time for many of, uh, for those countries that had to adjust. And the reason for the ban we were given <coughs> was that Kava was alleged to have caused liver disease. Almost 15 years later, in 2015, the German Administrative Court ruled that there was no conclusive evidence of the causal link between kava and liver disease. And that was after they had decimated our exports into Europe. So while this was welcomed in the region, it will take time for us to reestablish uh, the market in Europe because this will require significant resources uh, and effort. But nevertheless, uh, we, are, <coughs> we, are, uh, we welcome very much the, 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 the ruling by the German Administrative Court. Um, that aside, many Pacific Island countries have little capacity to meet standards requirements of international markets, and major gaps exist nationally. Of the 14 Pacific Island countries, Fiji and Papua New Guinea have, were, are the only two members that have well-developed quality infrastructure, infrastructure systems. But these remain partial and limited in scope. This is understandable as PICs have limited range of exports and focus on supporting the main exports such as fisheries products and processed agricultural goods. However, times are changing. 
Many PICs recognize the importance of S NTMs as many of them are shifting away from export of primary products or raw materials to value-added or processed products, as well as to um, diversify into services for which the ability to demonstrate compliance with certain quality standards become important. In addition, the Pacific Island countries are uh, participating in sub-regional and regional trade integration initiatives um, <clears throat> in our region, such as the Micronesian Trade Treaty, Pacific Island Countries Trade Agreement, PESA Plus with Australia and New Zealand, Interim EPA with the EU, which require compliance, um, especially in the trade agreements with our developed partners, uh, such as PESA Plus and EPA. And it is um, also important uh, that PICs protect uh, their own consumers from some standard products in the face of liberalization under those uh, FTAs. So <coughs> for us, um, so that is the state of play. Um, many uh, Pacific Island countries have no uh, quality infrastructure systems in place. So looking ahead, uh, so uh, what are we doing as a region? Um, <coughs> apart from Fiji and PNG, um, the other PICs of Pacific Island countries have little quality infrastructure systems in place. Vanuatu has recently established a National Bureau of Standards and is seeking membership of the ISO. But the starting point for many Pacific Island countries is to establish the foundations of national quality infrastructure systems, that is policies, laws, standards, measurement, conformance assessment, and accreditation um, and accreditation and certification systems. These must be tailored to their situation and to their export. For countries as small as the Pacific Island countries, the regional dimension of quality infrastructure systems linked to the trade agreements becomes, or trade integration initiatives becomes an important aspect to overcome. In this regard, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat is working with partners on a structured approach <coughs> <clears throat> against the ad hoc approach that has been followed in the past um, through a regional quality infrastructure project for the Pacific Island countries. Uh, this initiative has been endorsed by the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands trade officials in July this year, and we have received <clears throat> support from a few partners towards this project. Uh, the project will be funded partly by the EDF through the TradeCom2 project, and we'll also draw on the experience of the CARICOM uh, through the cross queue, which has a more advanced system, and will also share si and also share similar characteristics as the Pacific Island countries. Um, and on this note, um, uh, and on that project, um, for those of you that are developed partners, we still have room uh, for those that wish to support the project and welcome any assistance. Uh, towards the implementation of th this regional quality infrastructure project. In addition to that project, <coughs> the region is also working um, with sub-regional uh, groups uh, on a regional project on uh, uh, establishing regional standards on CARVA. This was based on the, uh, this follows the endorsement of the Codex Committee in 2017 to um, develop regional standards on CARVA as part of our efforts to reestablish uh, the international um, um, market um, for uh, CARVA in the future. Looking ahead, um, probably just to um, talk about the regional, uh, the regulatory collaboration, <coughs> um, which the uh, director had mentioned in her statements. Um, a regulatory cooperation would be welcomed by the Pacific Island countries if they have adequate national quality infrastructure systems in place. But the Pacific Island countries are far from this point. And for us, technical assistance and capacity building would be required. Um, in any case, regulatory cooperation um, uh, could, we, as we see it, could streamline procedures and improve um, uh, uh, um, and reduce barriers to trade, but should not result in more restrictive measures, particularly on, on non-parties. And a word on voluntary sustainability uh, standards. 
uh, we also recognize that in recent years there has been an increase in voluntary sustainability standards. Very often <coughs> it is the private sector in the developed countries that are creating standards to satisfy sustainability concerns of their consumers um, and their manufacturers. While sustainability is very important, small developing countries producers find it, will find it difficult to comply or realize significant gains from meeting those standards, noting the high fixed costs of assessing conformance. The development community has a role to play uh, in this area in promoting systems that offer collaborative approaches for demonstrating compliance with uh, voluntary sustainability standards. Um, and governments, too, also uh, should take responsibility for voluntary sustainability standards that the private sector are developing and to ensure that producers in developing countries are able to comply with these voluntary uh, sustainability standards and to establish mechanisms for collaborative approaches to setting uh, that allows developing countries producers to provide um, 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 uh, to participate in voluntary sustainability standards. And, um, and on this point, I come back to this issue of the cover ban that we had faced. And this was really uh, an area um, where we were affected by this voluntary sustainability standard. In fact, in our consultations with the European Union uh, after 2000, after the bans were imposed, the European Union told us, no, we are not the ones that are imposing the ban. Go to our member states. So when we went to the member states, the member states said, no, it is not us. We are not imposing the ban. It's the, prim it's the private sector. The, the pharmaceutical companies who have gotten together and blocked the um, uh, um, import of cover. So for little countries like us, I mean, 15 years after the ban have, have have, um, were, were imposed, then it was determined that there was no uh, causal link, there was no evidence, but by that time we have uh, almost decimated uh, an export, an important export sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You've highlighted some critical issues um, in your presentation, uh, particularly the vulnerability of small island developing states like the Pacific and the Caribbean in uh, trying to address these non-tariff measures, particularly in the area of standards and quality infrastructure. Um, I think it's crucial for us to begin to look at how we can assist countries to address these issues and also how we can influence the process by which NTMs are rolled out. Um, we had a similar issue with uh, Jamaican Aki, which was deemed poisonous for about 30 years. <laughs> and um, from the 1970s till I think almost 2000. And it's uh, difficult when you're small countries to be able to, to navigate who's actually imposing the ban and who is actually responsible for lifting it. In addition to which, in the, in the area of, of agreements, one of the difficulties that you've also highlighted is market access is theoretical if one cannot penetrate the market. And these non-tariff measures have an, a way of in a way eroding whatever market access you've gained in the context of an agreement. Um, so that's another area that I think we need to look at as well. So thank you very much for these uh, comments. Um, and I'll turn to uh, His Excellency Mr. Alejandro de la Peña um, for his comments on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, UNCTAD for the kind invitation to be part of this panel. It is really my pleasure to share ideas with such uh, distinguished uh, colleagues and co-panelists. And of course, a special thanks to our extraordinary chair for this session, Ms. Pamela Cook Hamilton. Let me begin by mentioning that the Latin American Integration Association, ALADI as we call it in Spanish, and UNCTAD have a long record of working together. Certainly cooperation has been more fluid in recent years, especially regarding the activities related to the analysis of non-tariff measures 
and uh, in the Latin American region. But cooperation between both organizations has now been fruitful over the last two decades. In 1981, both organizations signed their first Memorandum of Understanding for Collaboration in the maintenance of a database on trade control measures. Since then, ALADI and UNCTAD have signed different legal instruments in order to deepen the cooperation between them in a wide variety of areas of common interest, particularly concerning data collection of measures affecting international trade in goods and services. Today, our main cooperation involves activities of data analysis and col <coughs> collection and classification of non-tariff measures, the NTMs, within the region. ALADI holds a database that is updated daily by ALADI specialists with information covering 18 Latin American countries. 13 of those countries are members of ALADI, but we also add five other countries from Central America, Guatemala, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras. The cooperation program includes an important support from UNCTAD from the management and updating of this data database, as well as technical support from ALADI that involves different activities of coordination and adjustment of the information in order to fulfill certain specific requirements that UNCTAD is interested in. Regional NTMs are classified by ALADI experts according to UNTAC's classification and does not judge on the legitimacy, adequacy, necessity, or discrimination in any form of policy intervention used in the international trade. The results of our collaboration are clearly evident in the accuracy of the data collected and the contribution of our regional database to the Trade Analysis Information System of American Program, the Trains of America, a global database that provides data on trade control measures, including tariffs, paratariffs, non-tariff measures, for more than 150 countries in total. But also the importance of our collaboration has positioned ALADI as an NTM benchmark in data collection in the Latin America region offering accurate information on NTMs that could be used by the general public, the private and public sectors, as well as decision makers. Nowadays, we are a great deal of information is available, nowadays that where a great deal of information is available, available, offering accurate, useful, and updated information is crucial. We consider the ALADI UNCTAD collaboration is orientated in that direction. Well, after this brief description of our cooperation, I would like to dwell in the subject of our panel, that is to examine the potential of trade regulations and voluntary standards as powerful tools in achieving sustainable development. Let me start by saying that trade regulations and voluntary standards are powerful tools, but they are not the only one available. Cooperation is equally important, if not more effective, in achieving the sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda. TRs and VS are very powerful tools because if someone does not comply with them, they get penalized firstly through mandatory trade rules or secondly through market preferences. Linking TRs and VS with the SDGs remind me of the debates held some years ago concerning the so-called trade-related measures in particular trade and environment and trade and labor standards, but with an increased level of complexity. Back then, environmental measures that affected trade, such as the tuna dolphin case, were contrary to GATT rules and therefore had to be justified under the Article 20 of GATT, which is general exception. The tuna dolphin confirmed at that time that measures to protect the life of health of people, animals, or plants, or to conserve exhaustible natural resources, may be applied as long as they are necessary and as long as they are not used to discriminate between countries. Only then they are justified. There are other requirements, of course. It was also established that among the measures that can be adopted to achieve the objective, regulatory authorities should choose among those that are the less trade restrictive. With the conclusion of the Uruguay Round and the establishment of the World Trade Organization, environmental measures became an integral part of the WTO rules, 
in particular under the TBT and the SPS agreements. These agreements specify the conditions under which technical regulations and voluntary standards could be used without violating the WTO's trade rules. A definition of a technical regulation in the TBT agreement uh, in the annex was particularly relevant to define relationships between production and processes methods and the application of trade measures. According to this definition, only the PPMs, the process and production methods, that affect the characteristics of a product are covered by technical regulations. In other words, TRs could not be used to justify measures that do not affect the characteristics of a product. This definition turned out to be very important to allow the importing countries to protect their environment without interfering with the PPMs that the producing country use according to its own environmental policies or conditions. This definition also ensures that compliance with environmental or health protection measures can be objectively verified at the border and at a product level. Measures based on PPMs that do not affect the characteristic of a product pose other type of problems. With such measures, compliance cannot be tested at the border. Verification, therefore, is made in situ, which arises problems of jurisdiction between countries. The situation becomes even more complex when one takes into account that compliance verification needs to be done at the company level in order not to unfairly sanction companies that do comply. I mention these issues just to put into context my following comics, comments on the topic that occupies us in this session. Firstly, since trade measures can be a very powerful tool for achieving the SDGs, it is crucial to use them carefully to avoid unwanted effects such as introducing measures that disguise trade protection. Secondly, multilateral trade rules, and more specifically the WTO rules, are compatible with and directly or indirectly support the SDGs. Such is the case, for example, with regard to SDGs uh, 1 and 2, ending poverty and hunger, or promoting economic growth and employment, or reducing inequality within and among countries. Therefore, now more than ever, we must support the multilateral trade system if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals, because protectionism and trade wars are not compatible, compatible with these goals. And by the way, the development we have been working uh, since the decade of the 60s uh, and the creation of UNCTAD, and we are still working on, on that, is not really a new issue. Thirdly, TRs are not appropriate to support, in my opinion, the SDGs that do not affect the characteristics of products. It is difficult to imagine how technical regulation can contribute, for example, to the elimination of poor poverty or to reduce inequality within and among countries. On the other hand, voluntary sustainable standards can be applied to contribute to the achievement of some of the SDGs through, for example, labeling or certification of goods or services. However, taking into account the nature and the impact that PS may have in the market, this is important, again, to be very careful when using them and to consider the establishment of some guidelines to prevent abuses. These guidelines may include, among others, the following. BSS must be developed and implemented with the spirit of cooperation. The aim is to support achieving a superior goal, not to impose the vision or the interests of one party over the other. BSS should be applied as a positive incentive, not as an instrument of coercion. Instead of penalizing those that would not meet or cannot meet the, a goal, those who can show meet the goal shall be recognized and rewarded. Wherever possible, BSS must be based on outcome rather than how producers achieve that outcome. It is better for producers to decide how to achieve a goal by choosing their own path according to their own possibilities. And that also helps to not put producers uh, in the challenge of compliance with 10 different standards for the same thing. Uh, that, that reduce uh, costs. 
then VSS should be subject to public consultations and advertise in advance so that producers have time to adapt their production to comply with them. Efforts to achieve a goal should be recognized and supported by VSS even before the goal is fully reached. It is at the beginning that producers need the support, not at the end, not when they already arrive to reach at the uh, goal uh, desired. VSS should be applied at the producer's level, not countries as a whole. Otherwise, those producers who meet the objectives would be wrongly penalized. And uh, I think this is uh, just some personal ideas about the use of TRs and VS uh, as tools for achieving the SDGs uh, goals. But I'm sure that during our debate, others' ideas will arise and will have a wide and, and we will have a wide and interesting exchange of uh, opinions that will enrich our knowledge of this subject. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for your um, extremely detailed outline on, on, well, not just our cooperation, but on the issues facing us. I particularly liked your reference as I was in the Uruguay round negotiations a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the whole issue of trade related measures, particularly in relation to environment and labor, uh, were raised. And it, 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 in a way, has come back to haunt us. Um, because, in a way, that's what is happening with the voluntary sustainability standards. And so I, I'm very, I'm very um, taken with your comments with respect to trying to ensure that trade rules are not used or trade regulations. Um, as a means of protectionism and that VSS are not abused. And I, I like the idea of setting up some kind of guidelines uh, for the use of voluntary sustainability standards so that we can avoid the kind of impact on developing countries that has already been emerging in several markets. Um, so perhaps that is something that we can explore later. Um, it's going to be a, another set of negotiations, but <laughs> But I, I, I do think that it's an important issue that we need to explore because it is becoming more and more prevalent and it is being used as, as a mechanism for protectionism um, and to some extent being abused in, in certain markets. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to Mr. Viwanu Nasunu, who's the Assistant Secretary General for the ACP Group of States, joining us from Brussels. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Director. Um, if you allow me, uh, I would like to switch to, to fr into French. And I guess we have interpretation for it. Yeah. Non, et merci encore une fois d'avoir uh, invité le, le groupe ACP et de nous avoir associé à ce dialogue. Parce que nous pensons qu'il s'agit d'un dialogue. C'est un, un processus évolutif. Uh, nous représentons, nous représentons uh, 79 uh, pays, 48 en Afrique, 16 dans les Caraïbes et 15 dans le Pacifique. Euh, qui, de notre point de vue, représente les, les pays les plus vulnérables au niveau du commerce international et, et qui, dans notre relation en particulier qui nous lie avec nos, euh, notre partenaire euh, privilégié qui est l'Union européenne, et je suis désolé, mais je comprends que notre collègue de l'Union européenne ne, ne soit pas là avec nous ce matin parce que je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de choses que nous, disent, nous allons dire qui sont aussi liées à la, aux actions qu'il mène, mais... Et je pense que l'information leur sera euh, euh, transmise par la suite. Donc, ce que je disais, c'est que dans notre euh, relation, euh, c'est pour cela d'ailleurs que nous sommes basés à Bruxelles, euh, nous, voulons que nos, nous voudrions que nos pays, euh, comme je disais, les plus vulnérables, puissent réellement tirer parti de, 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 de l'offre d'accès au marché euh, qui nous est faite depuis plus de 40 ans. Mais comme vous l'avez euh, correctement indiqué, c'est qu'un accès au marché euh, en soi, euh, n'est pas forcément euh, promoteur de développement du commerce. Il y a toute une série d'autres euh, actions qui doivent être menées et euh, récemment, euh, de plus en plus, des questions qui sont liées aux, aux mesures non tarifaires. Euh, D'ailleurs, pour ceux qui suivent euh, l'actualité euh, africaine, euh, vous avez entendu cette année le lancement euh, officiel de, de la zone de libre-échange continentale africaine et les analyses indiquent très clairement qu'un des critères de succès de la réalisation de cette zone de libre-échange, ce sera la capacité des, des, des pays africains à surmonter 
les barrières non, commerciales, non tarifaires qui existent entre... Euh, parce que vous l'avez indiqué dans le cas de la Jamaïque, mais hein, je pense qu'en Afrique, plus qu'ailleurs, euh, les barrières euh, non tarifaires constituent l'obstacle majeur ou essentiel au développement du commerce intra-africain, et je dirais intra-ACP de manière, de manière générale. Donc, la dynamique qui nous, euh, qui, qui nous mène dans notre réflexion, c'est de voir comment est-ce que, euh, en face de, 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 de l'acteur le plus, le plus important en termes d'édiction de normes, euh, nos, nos, nos tarifaires, l'Union européenne, comment est-ce qu'un un groupe de petits pays peut s'organiser pour réellement faire évoluer euh, la politique développée par cet acteur majeur nous, nous, nous le faisons dans ce cadre, sachant que nous avons le cadre formel ou, j'allais dire, réglementaire de, de, qui est ici à Genève avec l'OMC. Avec euh, mais nous pensons également que dans la coopération, dans le dialogue, nous pouvons anticiper et faire comprendre beaucoup plus de choses. Euh, C'est en cela que depuis à peu près une, 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 presque une vingtaine d'années, depuis 18 ans, nous travaillons avec euh, nos partenaires européens sur préparer nos pays à, à répondre aux évolutions des normes euh, des, qui, sont, qui sont développées. Euh, tout récemment, en 2016, euh, ont été adoptées une, une nouvelle série de règles qui sont conclues dans un règlement euh, sur la santé des plantes et qui va entrer en vigueur le 16 décembre 2019. C'est un règlement qui révolutionne complètement l'approche de l'Union européenne par rapport à, à, à l'accès au marché et euh, qui impose euh, la présentation de certificats phytosanitaires pour tout produit et qui présente maintenant une liste de produits qui sont appelés des produits à haut risque. Donc, qui sont, euh, avant même qu'il qu y ait des problèmes euh, qui soient identifiés par rapport au produit, le produit est estampillé, produit à haut risque. Donc, maintenant, il appartient à l'exploitateur de démontrer à l'avance que son produit n'est pas réellement un produit à haut risque, comme cela a été dit. Donc, cela va force, fortement changer la dynamique en termes d'approche de, de, par rapport au, à, à la politique d'accès au marché. Alors, cela va aussi, va aussi de pair avec le fait que, de manière générale, euh, notre partenaire indique que ces moyens sont de plus en plus limités. Donc, je ne sais pas ce que ça en est par rapport à nous, puisque s'ils si ont des moyens limités, nous les nôtres, je ne sais pas comment nous pourrons les qualifier. Et donc, du coup, la charge de la preuve est progressivement euh, reversée vers l'exportateur. Vous savez que depuis quelques années, il appartient à nos pays, euh, au niveau de ce que nous appelons les, les autorités compétentes, de démontrer et de faire tout le processus de certification avant exportation. Avant, ceci revenait aux autorités européennes qui le faisaient euh, en fonction des produits reçus. Donc, donc, non seulement il nous appartient maintenant de renforcer les capacités de nos, de nos autorités compétentes, mais en plus, il nous faut également travailler avec, avec nos exportateurs sur la charge de l'origine. Puisque avec la réglementation REX qui, est, qui entre en vigueur euh, maintenant, euh, nous ne pouvons plus... Euh, euh, avoir comme autorité douanière uniquement la charge de, 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 de vérifier les certificats d'origine. Les certificats d'origine doivent être préparés par l'exportateur et avec, en lien avec les, les, les autorités douanières. Donc toute une série de, de, de mesures qui, euh, qui apparaissent à la fin comme des contraintes au, au développement du commerce et sur lesquelles nous sommes en train de travailler. Ce que nous faisons, parce qu'en réalité notre ambition à la fin, euh, développer le commerce si nous voulons atteindre les, les objectifs de développement durable, c'est faire en sorte que le petit producteur, à la base, euh, reçoit un peu plus de ce qu'il exporte et surtout euh, qu'il puisse avoir une pérennité dans ses exportations. Donc, notre point d'entrée, c'est la situation du petit producteur lorsque nous sommes dans l'agriculture. Comment est-ce que nous pouvons euh, nous, nous organiser pour aider ce, produ ce petit producteur agricole à maintenir une activité euh, qui soit saine, qui réponde aux règles du marché pas seulement d'exportation, j'allais dire, euh, euh, vers l'Europe ou vers les États-Unis, mais également au niveau, au niveau régional, parce que le commerce intra-régional est, est un commerce sur lequel nous pensons qu'il faut donner de plus en plus d'importance. De, 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 Donc, ce que nous, nous, nous faisons, c'est euh, prendre des situations, comme il est arrivé récemment, où, euh, à la suite d'une interception de piment venant du Kenya, euh, avec une alerte lancée au niveau de l'Allemagne, nous avons une situation où le, les exportations ont été rejetées de telle sorte que de plus de 400 entités productrices au, au, au Kenya, en une année, on est passé de 400 à 15 producteurs. 
Et on peut imaginer ce que ça représente euh, comme drame par rapport à la société, par rapport euh, aux, aux producteurs dans ce pays. Et pourquoi ceci est arrivé Parce que dans le système euh, européen, et c'est en cela que je pense que le, vous m'excuserez de mettre l'accent beaucoup sur l'Union européenne, mais je pense que c'est un acteur majeur et je pense que si on arrive à travailler avec eux, euh, ce que nous, nous obtenons avec eux peut également être euh, utilisé par ailleurs. Dans le système européen, on a deux niveaux de normes. On a les normes qui sont euh, les limites imposées, les limites de résultats qui sont imposées par rapport au, au, à la réglementation européenne. Et puis, dans ces limites, on a celles qui sont aux normes internationales, c'est-à-dire qui correspondent à la limite qui impose des dégâts à la santé. Alors, si euh, l'intercession dans un État membre européen euh, indique des limites qui ont dépassé les normes proposées par l'Union européenne, mais qui ne sont pas encore au niveau des normes qui ont un impact sur la santé, le pays qui intercepte le produit n'a pas obligation d'en informer la, 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 la Commission européenne. Ce qui veut dire que l'État exportateur ne reçoit aucune information parce que ce n'est que la Commission européenne qui lance l'alerte. Donc si un pays, un État membre européen, intercepte un produit parce que ça a dépassé une norme technique, j'allais dire, mais qui n'a pas, pas un impact sur la santé, personne n'est au courant. Ça reste une information au niveau du pays, mais ça autorise le pays à rejeter les exportations euh, venant euh, du pays qui est, qui, est, qui, est, qui, est, qui est mis en cause. Donc notre travail à nous, c'est de faire en sorte que, de manière constante, nous avons une cellule de veille, euh, de faire en sorte que, de manière constante, nous ayons cette information. Dès qu'une euh, interception est faite, quelle est la cause de cette interception et pourquoi Et faire en sorte que l'exportateur, le pays exportateur, soit, euh, soit informé et que les mesures appropriées soient prises. Mais de l'autre façon, nous avons indiqué à nos partenaires que non, vous ne pouvez pas garder cette information un peu comme une information confidentielle euh, parce que l'impact par rapport à, à l'exportation euh, est, 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 est très négatif. Donc le travail que et nous sommes en train d'évoluer vers cela, c'est que euh, nous sommes en train de travailler avec nos partenaires pour que de manière systématique, dès qu'il y a une intercession à une frontière quelconque, que ceci soit automatiquement versé dans la base de données centrale pour que tout le monde soit informé et qu'une notification euh, automatique soit faite aux pays exportateurs. Nous avons toute une série de choses comme ça, mais qu'est-ce que cela dit également Cela dit également que la bataille permanente que nous avons, de dire à tous nos partenaires, que ce soit l'Union européenne ou tous les autres pays euh, développés, de faire en sorte que les normes que nous, auxquelles nous arrivons ensemble dans les ancêtres internationales multilatérales, multilatérales soient celles qui soient reflétées au niveau, au, au, au niveau de chaque entité, puisque... Cela a été dit, nos pays n'ont pas la capacité de pouvoir s'adapter à des normes qui sont aussi évolutives, surtout lorsqu'on n'arrive pas à prouver que ces normes-là ont des effets néfastes sur la santé. Nous participons au processus d'ensemble pour que lorsque les normes sont édifiées et sont, sont édictées, nous puissions les accepter parce que nous les reconnaissons comme ayant un impact sur la santé ou sur l'environnement. Mais lorsque on va au-delà de ça pour des questions techniques, nous pensons qu'il s'agit tout simplement de barrières euh, volontaires euh, au commerce, et euh, la coopération que nous avons, euh, le débat que nous avons avec nos, nos, dans le cadre du partenariat vise à ce moment-là à faire en sorte que ces normes soient abaissées, et ces limites soient abaissées pour ne correspondre qu'à ce que nous avons tous à convenu au niveau multilatéral. Donc ce sont des actions qui vont euh, perdurer. Et pour ceux qui suivent l'actualité, nous sommes en train de rentrer dans une nouvelle phase de négociation de notre partenariat entre le groupe ACP et l'Union européenne. Le partenariat actuel expire en 2020. Et ce que nous voulons euh, renforcer dans ce partenariat, c'est également cette approche. Comment est-ce que, de manière beaucoup plus pratique, nous pouvons mettre en exergue ou mettre en œuvre cette coopération qui fait que, très rapidement, nous pouvons favoriser le commerce, non seulement de nos pays vers l'Union européenne, mais également aider à développer le commerce euh, intra-ACP, euh, que ce soit intra-régional ou interrégional dans le groupe, dans le groupe ACP. Une, une chose également euh, qui, sur laquelle nous travaillons fortement, c'est et c'est lié également aux, 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 aux normes volontaires de durabilité, euh, c'est le développement de capacités locales de certification. Parce que ce qui pose réellement euh, problème, c'est le coût de ces, ces certifications-là. Alors, nous euh, travaillons avec l'entièreté des, des, des entités de certification. Euh, nous avons mis des moyens de la coopération à disposition pour que des formateurs locaux soient formés pour pouvoir eux-mêmes former d'autres euh, certifiés au niveau local et former d'autres euh, euh, personnes ressources au niveau local pour faire cette certification. Cela réduit le coût dans un premier temps de 1 à 3, mais on espère à, au bout de la ligne euh, de 1 à 10. Et cela nous permettra de pouvoir, euh, tout en respectant ces certifications ou ces normes volontaires, 
de faire en sorte que cela soit fait dans une logique qui est, un, comprise et admise par ceux à qui cela est imposé ou qui voudraient eux-mêmes se soumettre volontairement à ces, à, à ces mesures parce que l'information leur a apporté par un des leurs, la, les formateurs sont des formateurs locaux, mais de l'autre côté également que ce soit quelque chose qui soit intégré dans la dynamique euh, de production locale avec euh, des acteurs locaux qui eux-mêmes se déterminent à respecter ces normes-là. Dans un des programmes que nous avons avec un de nos partenaires, nous avons développé nous-mêmes une charte de durabilité. Une charte de durabilité qui reprend en fait euh, quasi euh, exhaustivement toutes les chartes qui sont imposées à, à, à tenter dans les, différentes, dans, dans, dans les différentes configurations. Et cela nous permet, lorsque nous travaillons avec, euh, avec un exportateur euh, ou un producteur dans nos pays, de lui dire, écoutez, vous vous engagez à, un, à une série de choses en termes de durabilité, en termes d'environnement, en termes de, de travail des enfants. Mais ce sont nous-mêmes qui, nous, nous qui, nous, qui nous imposons ces, ces, ces chartes de durabilité. Et tout exportateur, euh, y compris les multinationales qui vont dans nos pays, euh, devront se soumettre à ces, ces chartes-là. Bon, maintenant, le, le défi, ce sera de faire en sorte que cette charte-là soit également reconnue au niveau multilatéral, euh, sans être une nouvelle charte, mais que ce soit une sorte d'agglomération de tout ce qui se fait euh, déjà euh, et qui est déjà sur le marché. Donc, ce sont des exemples un peu de comment est-ce que nous travaillons. Euh, je finirai par prendre le cas euh, que l'ambassadeur euh, des îles du Pacifique avait indiqué en, en entrée, celle du, du, du Cava. Le Cava, euh, que nous, je pense qui est appelé la boisson des dieux, euh, est un produit sur lequel nous avons travaillé, nous sommes fiers d'avoir été à, aux côtés et des, des pays du Pacifique pour mener cette bataille-là, parce qu'il ne s'agissait pas seulement des pays du Pacifique ou du Cava en tant que tel, mais c'est un symbole, comme le coton l'a été au niveau de l'OMC, pour nous c'est un symbole en termes de, 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 de restriction, euh, j'allais dire, euh, exagérée par rapport à, à, à des pays qui n'ont, euh, s'ils étaient tout seuls, ils auraient abandonné la production et l'exportation depuis longtemps. Mais c'était euh, une bataille, j'allais dire, de principe, euh, morale que nous avons menée aux côtés des, des États du Pacifique, pour arriver aujourd'hui à la situation où finalement il a été reconnu que la norme imposée était exagérée. Le travail n'est pas fini. Et nous devons maintenant accompagner ces pays maintenant à transformer cette opportunité d'accès au marché en réalisation réelle et, et, et à développer des produits qui peuvent être réellement amenés sur le marché pour prouver que ce qui était envisagé n'était pas seulement euh, au-delà d'une question de précision, ce n'était pas un leurre, mais réellement c'était une opportunité réelle de développement euh, économique et de développement humain sur laquelle nous travaillons. J'ai été surpris de voir, j'étais dans un pays ouest-africain récemment, dans un supermarché, et j'ai vu ranger des allées pleines de, de produits de noni. Le noni a également suivi plus ou moins la, la, le même processus un peu de, de, de mise au banc pendant longtemps. Et aujourd'hui, aux États-Unis et même en Afrique, ce produit est reconnu comme un produit qui a des, des, des vertus sanitaires et, et, et considérables. Et ce produit, maintenant, est promu par les grandes enseignes. Alors que pendant longtemps, ces mêmes grandes enseignes avaient indiqué que c'est un produit, parce qu'il n'était pas connu, était un produit qui avait des, des effets néfastes sur la santé. Donc, c'est un travail permanent, et je vais, vais m'en arrêter là, d'explication, de, 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 de conviction, de plaidoyer que nous avons à faire. Et nous sommes heureux de le faire dans un cadre comme celui-ci. Nous, notre engagement en tant que groupe ACP, c'est d'avoir ce privilège de pouvoir parler, j'allais dire, de murmurer à l'oreille des grands et de pouvoir prendre les préoccupations de nos, de nos petits pays, de nos petits États et faire en sorte que nous puissions les porter ensemble et, et, et infléchir un peu les positions qui sont des fois un peu trop dogmatiques de la part de nos partenaires. Voilà, je, je m'en arrête là et puis bien entendu, nous restons disponibles s'il y a des interrogations suscitées par notre intervention. Merci. Thank you very much, ASG. Um, thank you for some practical um, ideas and, and interventions that you have undertaken. Um, I particularly am taken with the issue of uh, the transparency in terms of the information um, when something is intercepted and making sure that the information is passed to the producer so that it's just not held in abeyance and nobody knows the where or the why because that's part of the problem. It's one thing for your goods to be held, it's another thing to know why, so you can actually fix the problem. If you can't, then it doesn't, it doesn't address the issue. So the automaticity of the transmission of information, 
also on the, the voluntary sustainability standards, um, the cost is is incredible. And if it's now at four to five hundred different standards, it's going to be very difficult for countries and small country producers to continually, you know, meet this moving goalpost. And how do you determine, you know, what is actually a standard and what is not just protectionism or seeking to prevent um, developing countries from accessing the market? So uh, that's another issue that um, we're glad that you're working on. The sustainability charter, I'd like to hear more about that at some point um, to see how we can and incorporate it into our work as well. So I just want to thank you for those uh, interventions. Um, I'd like to turn to Ms. Natalie Bernasconi, uh, Executive Director of International Institute of Sustainable Development. Thank you. Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank UNCTAD for inviting me to participate in this important event, and I'm of course honored to take part in this distinguished panel. 26 years ago, the global community came together for the Rio Earth Summit, affirming that states should reduce and eliminate unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. The Rio Declaration set a foundation not only for governmental action but for all stakeholders to in integrate sustainable development considerations and goals into their consumption and production decisions. In many respects, the development of the numerous voluntary sustainability initiatives, including voluntary labels, standards and other market-based sustainability initiatives, can be traced back to this original call to action. It is reflected today in Sustainable Development Goal number 12 on responsible consumption and production. Sustainability standards can specify requirements for producers, for traders, for manufacturers, retailers, or service providers. The specifications can relate to a wide range of sustainability issues, including the respect for basic human rights, labor standards, environmental impacts of production, and so forth. Over the past years, there has been a massive growth, as we heard, of sustainability standards. Where such initi initiatives were initially targeted um, to limited niche markets, and often associated with luxury items. Today, such initiatives have, not, have entered into mainstream channels. The Global Standards Directory, the Eco Label Index, is currently tracking, as we heard, 463 eco labels in 199 countries and across 25 industry sectors. The three ma main driving forces behind the growth of standards markets in the last three years are, as you surely all know, consumer demand, corporate demands, and government action. First, end consumers are the primary driving force behind the growth of com standard compliant markets, and the demand will likely increase quickly with new demands of consumers in emerging markets. Second, Mainstream corporations responding to the increasing <coughs> pressure exerted by the consumer demanding more environmentally friendly and fair trade products. And finally, the public sector plays a role as it often promotes the adoption of sustainability standards through legislation or public procurement. The criteria applied by different initiatives are in a period of rapid change. They increasingly address multiple sustainable development issues explicitly. IISD, my organization, has been analyzing and reviewing standards in various sectors since 2008. Environmental criteria, criteria remain the most prevalent and robust across initiatives. However, here even we see that criteria relating to conservation and greenhouse gas management tend to have less presence or emphasis across initiatives. Social criteria are also broadly covered in 
sustainability initiatives. They revolved largely around the ILO conventions, and they also tend to cover health and safety and employment conditions. The majority of initiatives reviewed, however, place less emphasis on gender, employment benefits, community involvement, and humane treatment of animals in their criteria. And finally, economic criteria are the least developed across the initiatives that IISD surveyed, with the more majority of initiatives reviewed having few or no economic criteria. Where economic criteria exist, the most common revolve around minimum wage requirements, but requirements relating to living wages, price premiums, and written contracts with producers are particularly rare. Fair trade is the only initiative with criteria covering all these aspects. I'd like to share with you from our analysis just three um, of the challenges we identified. First, we found that standards have the potential to give commodity producers a more prominent role in supply chain decision making by inviting their direct participation in organizational governance. However, standards can also reinforce formal and informal governance practices that exclude producers, many of whom already experience economic marginalization. Besides formalizing judicial pr procedures in standards organizations and improving transparency, standards organizations also need to address the informal barriers that restrict commodity pr producers from participating in organizational governance. This includes language barriers, cultural differences, and the opportunity costs to producers when they dedicate time to participate in governance rather than spending time on production or harvesting activities. These factors require explicit recognition when designing policies to improve producer participation in organizational governance. This might be achieved by creating more ownership of governance institutions to create equal opportunities for participation. Greater decentralization could also improve opportunities for participation by marginalized groups, such as indigenous people and women. Second, only a few standards, standard schemes penetrate value chain rulemaking to establish conditions around the terms of contracts. For example, fair trade stipulates a minimum price that importers must pay developing country suppliers to obtain certification. Organic standards also provide the premium differ differential to pay farmers on top of the conventional market price. And some certification initiatives require that price information be posted online. The availability of this information is extremely important because it can influence price formation. However, transparency in price and contract requirements re re remain the exception, and this leads to a tremendous power imbalance between buyers and sellers. Finally, and third, there continues to be a lack of transparency on production and consumption data. We need to improve transparency through improved information on market trends and the impacts of initiative in implementation. Ultimately, we need to combine a top-down and a bottom-up approach. As a market tool, sustainability initiatives need to address the economic, social, environmental, and traceability concerns of business and consumers. But on the other hand, sustainable initiatives need to be practical and realistic. They must reflect the producer situation and capacity while bringing real benefits to the producers. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Executive Director. I, I wanted to start with your last comment. <laughs> um, 
the top down and the bottom up approach uh, where you have the economic, social, environment and traceability concerns addressed while at the same time be practical, realistic and reflect producers' um, capacity. <laughs> Well, if you can find out how to resolve that, I think we'll win the Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> but hopefully we can we can get there. But I think it is, of course, something that we should aim at. Um, also, I uh, noted your, your comments regarding the, the standards having the potential, of course, to be barriers to trade, uh, particularly for primary commodity producers. And how do we address that, that dis dis discord? Um, the penetration of global value chains. The multinational companies tend to be the price fixers. And I think the ability to negotiate across the value chains is, is going to be even more critical as these standards continue to roll out. So that's something that we would want to discuss as well in the context of the NTMs. Um, before we go into discussion, I believe Bonapass wanted to make an announcement. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to make a, s a brief announcement regarding the trans uh, interpretation. So we have in uh, interpretation uh, into French, Russian, and English. We didn't expect the interpretation, but we have it, so that's great. But it's only in three languages at the moment. So bear with us. So French, Russian, English only. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open the floor for any questions, uh, any comments, discussion on the presentations that have been made. Anyone? No? It's crystal clear, everybody agrees. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Sarah. I'm from the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, ICTSD. I was wondering if you could speak to the interface between NTMs and SDG 5 in particular, because my organization has a program of work on trade and gender, which includes a track uh, that looks at standards and gender in particular. And we're interested in the role of gender discrimination in affecting the uptake of SPS standards, um, including through discriminatory access to training, the burden of, of cost on, on female SME, female-headed head SMEs, some of those phenomena. So if anyone was interested in, in, in looking at standards and, and gender in particular, that would, be, that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you for a very um, good panel. I really enjoyed listening to all the panelists. I've got just um, a few questions on the transparency issue. I was wondering, you know, UNCTAD developed at a certain point of time anyway, um, a few websites, portals, trade portals with regard to transparency, transparency, making NTMs become more transparent, etc. I would like, um, if possible, to have some uh, more information on that, where that work is, and um, if it's being properly used, or it's, is it useful, really? Um, because many of the panelists talked about uh, transparency issue in NTMs, which I very much agree to. Um, on ACP, I would like to thank um, Mr. Vivanu for a very, very good presentation. Si je peux me permettre, vous avez parlé d'une cellule de, de veille dans ACP qui surveille les normes, etc. Est-ce qu'on pourrait, s'il vous plaît, avoir plus d'informations Et euh, bien sûr, ACP avait aussi l'assistance, euh, il y a quelques années, du TBT-SPS programme qu'on a beaucoup utilisé, les membres en ont beaucoup utilisé. Est-ce que l'Union européenne, euh, enfin, si vous avez des informations à nous donner, euh, est-ce qu'il y aura une suite à ce programme Excusez-moi, j'ai... Oublié de me présenter, donc je me présente. Uh, je suis Puna Mohan, Economic Counselor at the Mission of Mauritius in Geneva. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those questions. Um, 
We also want to indicate that the French translation is being uh, provided as a courtesy. Um, it was not booked either. So thank you very much, thank translators. You. We're very grateful to you. Um, so the two questions on the table are standards and gender and on the transparency issue as well as uh, the ACP unit monitoring standards. Um, does anybody want to speak to the NTMs and gender issue? Is there particular attention paid to that? No. Um, just from our perspective, uh, our division actually has a trade and gender portfolio as well. And one of the things that we're starting to look at is the actual statistics um, with respect to penetration of markets and trade and gender. Um, one of the things we want to look at is not just in relation to women, but also in relation to men. Uh, because in certain parts of our world, uh, the men are actually uh, being marginalized as well. So we want to look at it from both perspectives. Um, it should be interesting to look at whether the NTMs actually have more of an impact on women or, or on, on a particular gender. Um, so that's something we can definitely look at and see how we can break out the, the statistical data. Um, so that's what I would say on that. Uh, perhaps we can speak further on it and see what work ICTSD is doing um, that we could partner on. Um, yes? Well, thank you. Uh, within Aladi, we are not working on, on, on standards uh, or technical regulations as such. It's, it's, it's the members who establish that kind of standards. But I would like to say, and I, uh, that's why I ask for, for the floor, that uh, the gender consideration is very much in, in, in our minds, uh, not in terms of standards, but in terms, for example, on the recent uh, case of an agreement between Chile and uh, Uruguay, where there is a chapter about uh, gender uh, in order to collaborate uh, with the purpose of uh, eliminating, as far as possible, uh, the, the barriers that you may face because of the gender, to put uh, uh, both genders or everybody in, in, the, in an equal footing in terms of opportunities. <coughs> I mention this because that's uh, why I mentioned in my first intervention that uh, that's the kind of a collaborative approach to try to uh, accomplish a goal uh, without uh, using, which is possible to use legitimately, uh, any kind of standard. What I want to say is that within the region in Latin America, we are working on it. We are working through the agreements among the, the member countries and a, in a uh, manner that is uh, more collaborative and, and defining what can be done to put the, the, the women and men in an equal uh, basis in, in all areas, education, work, etc., etc. But unfortunately, it's, or fortunately, it's not through the labeling or the technical regulation that we are working on that issue. Thanks. Yes, on, on the gender issue, uh, maybe we, I think last year, we, we signed a joint uh, memorandum in, between the CP and UN Women and on women economic empowerment, I think, uh, uh, Madam Chair, you were there in a different capacity yes. uh, <laughs> at, at, at that meeting. And we, we try, we are now committed to implement. If you look at the, the, the I would say, the, the profile of informal trade in our countries, developing countries, I would say that the border trading is mainly done by women, generally in our countries, at least in Africa. So if you look, you, you see all the barriers I would say, uh, which are facing those women in trading. And uh, it can go for, I mean, it cover all sort of, I say, harassment, and in some cases, assault. So the facilitating or making rules clearer or, or implementing the rules 
uh, in terms of facilitating trade at the borders, uh, which also are somehow uh, some uh, non-tariff measures, though who definitely will have clear and direct impact on, 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 the, on the women condition or the gender issues in, the, in, in our countries. So that is a way of doing it. The other way of doing it as part of our discussion with UN Women is you know, bringing them into what we call our new approach to value chain development. I think that was mentioned. If you move up the value chains, definitely you give more chance to women to really integrate and, and, and be part of the value chains, especially in the, in the agricultural value chains, because there we have uh, services pro uh, providers, you have activities which are more demanding in terms of uh, strength of our workforce, where can, which can be more uh, appropriate for, 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 for women empowerment. So we are really looking at, at uh, in, uh, into two perspectives, how we can really facilitate trade at borders where uh, we can diminish the uh, harassment to, to, to those women who really make it their daily life and, and trading uh, across the borders, but also moving up the value chains where we can see then uh, facing or diminishing the barriers at the, uh, when we go to service provision, but also to, to add value to the good that we export. Uh, that will be there, but should I go to the other question directly or we close the agenda issue oh, first? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe then use the courtesy of the French translation. Then thank you for providing this. Sur <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, la question de, uh, de, la, de la charte de durabilité, c'est une charte que nous avons développée avec un de nos partenaires qui est le, le collet ACP, qui est un collectif de d'exportateurs euh, ACP et d'importateurs européens, d'abord de fruits et légumes, et ensuite qui s'est élargi à d'autres secteurs, et qui sont partis également de questions SPS pour maintenant couvrir euh, toutes les dimensions du développement d'une entreprise, et, suite à des demandes qu'on leur a faites, également sur des, qui travaillent maintenant sur des questions d'appui aux, aux, aux autorités compétentes. Donc nous pourrons rendre l'information disponible, mais la charte couvre sept grands domaines, euh, les lois et les réglementations, euh, l'engagement civique, le, le respect des partenaires, euh, l'action en tant qu'employeur, mais également la protection de l'environnement, euh, bien entendu la, la qualité de la production et l'utilisation des bonnes pratiques agricoles. Après, ça se décline euh, euh, en, en conditions de travail, en utilisation des pesticides, euh, en, en en mesure de, de en, en gestion des, des, des déchets, protection de la biodiversité, il y a toute une ça se décline et en fait à la, à la, à la fin on a euh, selon les, les points qui sont donnés ça apparaît comme, comme une forme de rosace euh, conçue dans le temps euh, c'est encore une phase initiale nous venons de l'introduire et, et nous allons voir comment est-ce que cela peut être euh, déjà accepté comme élément de toutes les de tous les programmes que nous mettons en œuvre puis ensuite maintenant travailler avec des partenaires pour voir comment est-ce que cela peut euh, ne pas devenir une nouvelle norme, mais essayer d'en de, de, faire une synthèse de toutes les normes, euh, de telle sorte que si charte, cette charte est acceptée, de facto vous avez peut-être 90 à 95% de chances de pouvoir euh, respecter toutes les normes et certifications qui sont imposées par ailleurs. Donc c'est un peu cette façon de faciliter les choses pour nos producteurs euh, qui nous a amené à développer avec le collet ACP cette charte de la, de la durabilité. Et on a un système d'auto-évaluation qui peut même se faire en ligne. Euh, il y a un site qui est en train d'être euh, bêta testé et de telle sorte que euh, les groupements de producteurs peuvent eux-mêmes aller directement en ligne, mais il y a un système qui peut être téléchargé, donc on a besoin de rester en ligne tout le temps et ensuite faire les tests euh, soi-même euh, chez soi. Pour le, le programme euh, TBT, effectivement, nous avons eu... Euh, un programme qui est accompagné nos, nos États membres sur le, pour les aider à faire face aux, aux, aux obstacles techniques au commerce, qui a pris fin et sur lesquels nos, nos États membres ont demandé qu'il y ait un suivi. Effectivement, le Conseil des ministres, il y, a, il y a un an, nous a demandé de faire le suivi. La question a été discutée pas plus tard qu'il y a deux semaines au niveau des instances du groupe. Donc, un document d'action est présenté. Nous espérons que très... Euh, D'ici la fin de l'année, nous aurons un projet qui sera à nouveau sur la table et, et nous en parlerons d'ailleurs euh, avec nos partenaires de la CNICET pour voir comment est-ce qu'ensemble nous pouvons mettre nos moyens en, euh, pour faire en sorte que ce que nous allons développer soit quelque chose d'additionnel et vraiment directement utile. Un élément pratique dans, dans, dans la demande de nos États, est, est, vous savez, on travaille beaucoup sur les développements de capacités 
et sur des, ce qu'on appelle les infrastructures euh, soft. Et, mais on n'a pas beaucoup de moyens euh, sur tout ce qui est euh, développement des laboratoires et, et des centres de test. Donc, réellement, c'est là où nous voulons mettre l'accent euh, dans cette nouvelle phase. On va continuer, bien entendu, euh, l'action avec toute la, toute la partie soft, mais réellement, euh, mobiliser des moyens, on ne va pas construire des grands laboratoires euh, à coût de milliards, mais avec les, les peu de millions que nous, que nous pourrons mobiliser, c'est voir comment est-ce qu'on peut déjà renforcer euh, la capacité, les capacités de test de certains laboratoires au niveau régional et, et, et en faire des centres de référence pour pouvoir faciliter le, le, le suivi et, et l'évaluation de, de, certains, de certains produits au niveau, au niveau local. Donc c'est un peu cette approche-là dont nous allons forcément travailler avec des partenaires euh, qui ont mandat la, euh, dans le domaine, la CNUSED, l'ONUDI et, et, et d'autres partenaires, CrossQIO euh, dans les Caraïbes, mais également euh, Arso en Afrique, pour voir comment est-ce que euh, tout ceci peut être mis en œuvre de manière euh, appropriée. Thank you very much. Just very briefly on the issue of standards, as I mentioned, I think in the area of voluntary standards and initiatives, it will be important to uh, think about the standard setting process and to ensure that uh, women are uh, able to participate. And so first, that would, that would also mean that you need to take practical steps in terms of uh, maybe not having them fly far away to uh, another place somewhere in Geneva, for example. Um, and uh, also to address the language and cultural issues. Um, but I think that would make a, a big difference, which is now actually not really happening. And the second point is we, we actually did a review um, of the voluntary standards from a gender perspective. And uh, we were quite surprised to find that there are very few um, criteria relating to gender, actually, which also means, of course, that um, that the impact of uh, these standards that are aimed at fulfilling some of the SDGs certainly are not uh, comprehensive, um, especially with respect to gender. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, Bonapas, you wanted to make a comment? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to comment on the database and uh, the, the Distinguished Delegate of Mauritius mentioned about the database and transparency, and to say that if, as, as, as the director mentioned, we have a database on non-tariff measures. It's called the Trains Database. It's publicly available. It's on our website, so it's accessible. And it is um, of um, 109 countries, as he said, covering 90% um, of world trade. And uh, this is publicly available. We provide training as well on how to use the database. Uh, we continue to improve on the database. We continue to collect data regulations, which is not very easy to collect. It's a very intensive and extensive exercise. We work with Aladi to collect data uh, in, the, uh, in the Latin American region. As, as the Secretary General has mentioned, over 20 years of collaboration, and we continue to collaborate. So it is. Um, it, it, we, we want to uh, have a common database. The important thing is to have a common database so you can be seen comparable across countries. So we have a common classification system that we've developed in a group together, which we will, that group, uh, we, we will be having a meeting of the group uh, to, uh, um, on Wednesday on the classification system we have on non-tariff measures. So it's a common classification which enables comparison across countries so the data is collected on this common classification system, common categories, how we classify them, how we label them and name them. So it's a very comprehensive database. And, uh, and um, as I said, we provide training and uh, we continue to develop this. And uh, as barriers continue to multiply, uh, as these regulations are multiplying, we're trying to extend uh, uh, the, uh, the nomenclature as well. So some of the nomenclature which, on which we have lacunas and which we'll be addressing shortly are like subsidies, for example. We have to first define what it means and agree and then collect data uh, and, uh, and regula on the regulations on those. And this is a very uh, sensitive exercise as well. Rules of origin also. So this is some of the things we are doing to continually to improve the database and transparency. And of course, we have really 
uh, we are here to provide training or, um, uh, and willing to introduce you to the database uh, to use it, or we, we provide training across. So I wanted to make this about the, our, um, uh, the database that we have, and uh, which I think you will see hear more about it in the course of this uh, meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boniface. I'd, I'd really encourage you to look at the TRAINS database. It's quite comprehensive. Um, and it's very useful, particularly for developing countries to make the comparisons. Um, are there any other comments, questions? Yes? The Vanuatu? Yeah, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, just wanted to thank the, uh, the panelists for this very uh, interesting uh, NTM's uh, discussion. Uh, just to come back on the issue of um, Cover. I think I, I, I went out um, because I had a bilateral outside and just came back in, but um, just wanted to echo what uh, Ambassador Falemaka has raised with respect to the issue of cover. I think this is an issue that is outstanding, and um, I hope that we can work with um, UNTAD to look at how um, this, let's say, national standard, but also regional standard could be developed and um, having something that can help copper producing countries in the Pacific to export freely, but also uh, be sure that they will not be um, facing all these tariffs or even barriers when um, the product arrives in, uh, in the EU market, but also in the national market. But I just recall last two weeks I was in New York in the UNGA conference, and I was amazed to see that there was like almost 65 cover bars in New York City. <laughs> and if we can have some cover bars in Geneva or even in Brussels or in Europe, we'll be very, very interesting to see that. Um, and as ASG Vivanu said, and welcome ASG to Geneva, I used to be in Brussels with you, and uh, unfortunately I have to be here. <laughs> um, the Noni. The Noni is one that we don't even talk about it, but it's an important uh, product that um, healed a lot of diseases. And, and I'm happy to hear that now you can see them in some of the um, shelf in supermarkets in Africa. Uh, just look back to, I think, two more points or three with respect to fisheries. Um, in the Pacific, we have a lot of fish. But the thing is that we always have challenges when we want to export our fish because that's links to the infrastructure, um, storage, cooling system, and all this stuff. And, and that's where I um, wanted to um, encourage or even um, urge the ACP um, Secretariat as well as UNTAD and other agencies to make sure that um, we go towards not only having legislations, regulatory, and all these frameworks in place, but we should also focus on hard infrastructure to make sure that when the product of a country is finished, then it can go and doesn't face all these barriers um, in, in, in the international market. Because as Madame Madhuta, you said, we can even have all this market access. The problem is that we don't even use them because the issue of standard, the quality, and all this is always um, a barrier to our, and obstacles to our development. Um, just take the example of vanilla, um, even honey, and a classical example in, in, in the Cook Highlands. Uh, vani, va, honey is one that is a very, very high product um, for the Cook Highlands, but they face a lot of barriers when they want to export to New Zealand. E even though this is an organic type of product, but yet they still have challenges. So um, I, would, I mean, would like to call on ACP, the um, UNCTAD, but also other agencies to work in collaborations and make sure that those who, of us who are very, very small and we have very small markets and we have niche products that we can develop but the problem is that when we want to export, we are facing all these barriers. So um, that's what I wanted to contribute to that. Thank you very much. Right, Ambassador. Yeah. In, 
perhaps just to add to the discussion, I think, I mean, one of the challenges that we see from, from uh, particularly the small island developing side is that NTMs is a, a kind of a, a shifting goalpost. We are always having to catch up. New regulations are brought in time, you know, quite regularly, and we always are in this catching up mode, so to speak. Um, so, uh, and I think this is, you know, for us, which is a, a region that is still very far behind in terms of developing our quality infrastructure systems and our standards policies to address these TBT issues, you know, where do we start in all this as new voluntary standards are being proposed on one end and we are trying to start from the other end. So um, trying to catch up uh, and then new regulations are brought in by our key trading partners all the time in spite of the free trade agreements that we have. So so I think this is really the, <coughs> the, the sort of issues that we grapple with and I'm happy that uh, uh, to note that the ACP um, is very much uh, in taking leadership role um, in trying to address the, um, uh, the range of issues across the ACP group um, in engaging with our partners, the European Union in particular and others, uh, in bringing these uh, programs um, and also to note the um, importance of transparency to, to keep up with this multitude of regulations that are being imposed uh, on, on products that we export, particularly those that are of interest to us. And I think the UNTAD uh, database uh, would be an important step for us to, to learn from and to probably have some training on um, <coughs> uh, in this area. Yes, trade and gender, you know, as we say, we are still very far behind. But we recognize that, you know, women play an important role um, in our communities. They are the um, they are the ones that are uh, selling at the market, that, they, that are weaving and selling handicrafts, exporting some of these handicrafts. Uh, so they are engaging. They want to be part of the global value chain, but very often, um, how do you provide standards for handicrafts uh, and those sorts of things? So very practical things um, that we need to address. Thanks, uh, Chair, just to add those comments. <coughs> Thank you very much, Rao. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I have two questions uh, for the panelists. Um, and in fact, also, uh, maybe I, I would like to comment on the question on gender issues. Uh, because we in the UN Secretariat, we are always asked to, to, to um, uh, see at the gender dimension for very good reasons, because um, that is an important, an important issue in the Sustainable Development Goals and our membership. So we have, uh, in connection with NTMs, we look at, at three uh, dimensions there. One is uh, non-tariff measures don't have a neutral effect. They, they, smaller countries are disproportionately affected, and uh, Alessandro will, will talk more about this. So LDCs face higher trade costs due to non-tariff measures, even though the non-tariff measures themselves are the same for all countries. But smaller countries, poorer countries, um, are disproportionately affected. Um, so the, the, the same is true uh, for smaller companies. Smaller companies find it more difficult than bigger companies, and we know that women often have uh, smaller, uh, active in smaller companies. So the, the, the effect on women is, is different. Um, the second issue we look at is, um, do women get their information from different sources? Um, that is something, uh, there is anecdotal evidence, and we, we try to get some uh, more um, you know, evidence on this one. So, for example, that information is shared in some countries more among the men rather than shared with the women. But this is anecdotal evidence. We don't have any, any hard facts on this one, but uh, we, we try to, to um, improve our knowledge on that one. Um, and then the, the third aspect, and that has been mentioned by uh, Natalie in connection with voluntary standards, um, the, the participation of women in setting these standards. And there is a project by our colleagues from the um, Economic Commission for Europe, um, who are also um, our partners, and um, I believe they are here, um, and they are, they are speaking also tomorrow. Um, they, they have a project, they, um, 
they are very active on um, road standards, for example. So they, they um, are into the technical development of standards. And they have a project where they discover that many of the standards are really tailor-made for men and not for women, like uh, you know, safety belts and so on. So they have some, some interesting uh, aspects there. So um, they, they uh, look into the linkages directly between uh, gender and non-tariff measures also. Um, my, my, my questions are two. One is uh, uh, we have heard from, from uh, the panelists, uh, for example, from Ambassador Falemaka on the uh, PESA Plus uh, project, for example, <coughs> but also from, um, uh, Mr. Uh, from the Secretary General from Aladi um, on, on regional efforts with respect to non-tariff measures, uh, for example, to um, improve the notification, advanced notification, or uh, cooperative um, efforts. Um, how, how, how can UNCTAD help to bring this to the multilateral level? Because I think the regional efforts are very important, and we are very supportive for those. But um, in the end, we have a very integrated uh, trade map, so it would be good to bring this also to the multilateral level. And other current efforts sufficient or, or um, would there be more that needs to be done? And my second question is, tomorrow morning we have an interesting session where we bring together policymakers and researchers. So we have some really interesting and high level researchers uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, we, can, we can raise questions to them. And we have already received a couple of questions from policymakers. So if you would have any questions that you would like to ask uh, researchers, and these are high level researchers um, that work in the area of non tariff measures, um, uh, you from the panelists or anybody in the room, uh, please, please let, us, let us know what we should uh, ask the, the researchers um, where we can do more to support the policy making process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, anybody want to address the first question, which was uh, how can UNCTAD help to bring this to the multilateral level? Ambassador, do you want to? Yes, thank you for that uh, question. Um, <coughs> yes, the Pacific Island countries are um, uh, in the process of um, uh, the implementation of uh, the PESA Plus uh, commitments and uh, particularly in this area we see a very useful role for UNCTAD, um, mainly because as I said, many of the countries in our region are non-WTO members, many of the 14 Pacific Island countries. And these are all very new to them. So um, just uh, uh, creating awareness of what these are. I mean, when they are slammed with uh, measures uh, that restrict their imports, when they cannot sell their handicraft or they cannot sell their dried fish or whatever, you know, they need to understand the difference between SPS measures and NTM measures. So it's very, very basic. Um, and. Uh, I think this is this basic understanding uh, of what NTMs are, and to help governments um, address these uh, these issues um, in a more structured way, um, rather than because at the moment many of them don't have any policies, don't have any regulations, um, so governments don't have a way of dealing with these. So um, we see UNTAD's resources as a very important contribution to that process to help them. Um, um, develop the, the capacity themselves so that they can then comply with the, the commitments under PESA Plus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Secretary General. Yeah, for, for the question about the regional uh, experience on, in the case of Latin America. Uh, yes, we are all the members of uh, the ALADI, the Latin American <coughs> Integration Association, are members of WTO. So uh, most part of the uh, questions related to TVT or SPS are, are, are ruled and deal with in the context of the WTO. But we also have a, uh, a agreement, the regional agreement eight, which is on technical barriers to trade. And I say regional because all members of uh, LADI participate in it. There are other agreements where you have two or more members uh, in, in an agreement, something like what uh, is called a plurilateral agreement in, in, in the WTO. 
Now, this technical barriers to trade uh, regional agreement is basically uh, working on what can be done at the regional level that you cannot deal with in the WTO. In the multi so it, it's the other way around. And uh, it's based uh, on, on cooperation. So what we have there is uh, a uh, administrative commission of the agreement that uh, meets at least once a, a year. And that's an opportunity for members to uh, exchange information, to deal with the, some uh, problems that they have uh, in, in the region with another partner. Uh, there is also an opportunity to uh, develop this uh, horizontal cooperation among the members, that some members that are a little more advanced than others helps through the cooperation within the ALADI, those that are lagging in, 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 in this. But uh, there is also the possibility to uh, have uh, mutual recognition agreements, to have some harmonization on certain uh, non-tariff measures. And we have already uh, uh, agreed on a roadmap to identify uh, sectors in which uh, some members are interested in, in working. Uh, together to really eliminate the, the, the measures that are hindering the trade, intra-regional intra -regional trade. Nowadays, it's a very interesting process. Uh, when I say nowadays, it's the last two years. Uh, because Latin America is also uh, having some sub-regional uh, process of integration, like Mercosur. Even in the legal basis of Mercosur is Aladi, then Mercosur as such is a, a big uh, process. Uh, we have also within the region this uh, new development, which is the Alliance of the Pacific, uh, which comprises uh, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. Mercosur is Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia is almost there. Uh, and what happened in, in the uh, Pacific Alliance, uh, an interesting development is that they work a lot with the private sector, something that I am trying to promote in a LADI level also because we need to work together. Now, the representatives of uh, the cosmetic industry in each one of the four members of the Pacific Alliance agree among themselves on uh, how to eliminate or reduce or harmonize some uh, non-barriers, non-technical barriers to, to, to trade, non-tariff barriers, measures, uh, like uh, labeling, like the ingredients for the cosmetics, like with the definition of the cosmetic, and problems that they have in the different uh, markets of the four. And they agreed to something among the, the, rep, the private sector representatives of the cosmetic industry in the four countries. And then they work with their governments to convince them that that would be fine for the four to work along those lines. And, well, the governments look at that, and, and they cover the public interest, the, the, the health interest of the consumers, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, they agree that that would be fine, and that reduce and eliminate some of the non tariff measures among themselves. So that's, that's it. Now it's not an agreement just among uh, producers, but it's a commitment by governments. So then these four uh, uh, representatives of, of these countries, of the private sector, met with the other four of the Mercosur sector. And they are working on that. They have already agreed among themselves, and now they are working on convincing the four, the eight governments to put it in a lot. So I mentioned that because that's another way to deal with the uh, non-tariff measures, uh, but this case is coming from the private sector, but checked by the governments that protect the public interest. So that's a new development that, uh, well, I don't know how new, but uh, it's uh, not very common to, to elaborate on the non-tariff measures that way. That's what I wanted to, to mention. Thank you very much, Secretary General.
Um, any other comments? I wanted to make uh, just two comments. One on the issue of the quality infrastructure. Um, I think we tend to take for granted um, the availability of this quality infrastructure on a broad basis. And I, I must admit I was one of those until I was working with the private sector in the Caribbean. And I couldn't understand why certain countries, particularly from the OECS, um, were having difficulty getting their exports done until I realized that there is no quality infrastructure system within the OECS. And as a result, they had to send their goods to Trinidad or Jamaica. And of course, Trinidad and Jamaica were not putting them as a priority <laughs> over their products. And as a result, they would have to wait weeks to months to actually get back the information. So it immediately affected their ability to export, their market access, everything. So, you know, we tend to just assume that it's there, but it's not. And I think that that's a critical issue that we have to look at in, in terms of particular small developing countries and small producers. Um, the second issue is I remember bitterly complaining because I lived in Barbados for nine years and if there are any Barbadian delegates in the room. I'm not being mean. I'm just, Barbados doesn't have a lot of fruits available um, locally. So <laughs> most of the fruits are imported. I had deep difficulty with what they imported because they tended to come out of Miami and they were not tropical fruits. So I remember complaining bitterly to the owner of one of the major supermarkets. And I said, well, why don't you bring things out of Guyana? You know, it's cheap, it's great fruits, great quality, you know, just wonderful. And he said to me, well, we don't have a refrigeration process at a facility at the Guyanese airport. <laughs> and I thought, that's it? That, that's, that's why. <laughs> but it's as simple as that. There was no infrastructure mm -hmm. to keep the products in a particular way to get them out of Guyana, a half hour flight uh, to, to Barbados. And I, uh, just little things that can affect the ability to export and the ability to penetrate markets. So the quality infrastructure issue is very important. And the more we can work on that and try to see how we can assist countries in getting that in place. I think that would be also important in terms of addressing the NTMs issue. I also like that the private sector engagement, because I believe that private sector also driving the process in collaboration with government can be very, very um, productive and, and constructive. They're the ones who export. They're the ones who know. And so if they're able to engage early, I think that that's also a, a very constructive way to operate. Um, finally, I wanted to make the comment that, you know, I believe it was Ambassador who spoke about the fact that the NTMs are not, no, I think it was you. Anyway, someone spoke about the fact that the NTMs uh, are supposed to be neutral on their face. But in effect, yeah, in effect, right, they are not. And I think we, we tend to overlook that as well, that in the making of rules, uh, things may appear neutral on their face, but their impact, depending on the development level of the particular country or countries, can be completely different. And so I think we need to look at not just the facial value of a particular regulation or a particular rule, but more importantly, their actual effect on the countries, and then using those uh, as kind of measures to see how we can mitigate the impact. So just wanted to make those points. Um, are there any other comments? Yes? Can you introduce yourself, please? I'm Manish, and I'm from India. Uh, of course, I am also here in the capacity of a national platform, which Angtad uh, has done uh, in the program of uh, being the secretariat for the UNFSS. And I have some comments to make um, responding to some of the speakers which have, uh, you know, put their points. So the first thing which I wanted to sort of uh, request uh, as a, uh, you know, next uh, phase is, you know, we need to differentiate between the VSS and PSS based on, you know, how uh, the formulation of that particular uh, standard has been. Because uh, that goes a long way in understanding the dynamics of the process. That's one. The second thing about, uh, you know, the issues regarding the standards, uh, voluntary standards, uh, as we call it, or uh, in India, we focus more on the PSS part of it, is that, you know, we don't have to depend upon the governments to tackle some of these issues because any uh, voluntary standard would have a scheme owner 
And if there are issues in terms of, you know, some kind of, uh, what do I say, um, disharmony to the, uh, to the producer countries uh, in terms of uh, certain criteria and indicators, you know, as a uh, country or as uh, a body, you can actually approach the scheme owner and talk to them about some kind of a national interpretation. I can give you an example. In India, we had uh, some issues of the grapes uh, growers with respect to Global Gap, which everybody understands as a is a PSS and of course called as a VSS, uh, where you know there are uh, inside the schemes you know certain uh, modalities such as national interpretations, reciprocity, and uh, mutual recognition, which gives the scheme that particular openness and you know the producer countries to actually leverage those instruments to uh, you know sort of uh, get themselves benefited by changing some of these not changing the uh, essence of the scheme but to you know at certain uh, criteria levels to uh, include them uh, with the country's perspective and you know start uh, doing that so we did it in uh, in the uh, context of grapes, and you know, we have a national interpretation which Global Gap recognizes as an official uh, checklist, and you know, our farmers have been benefited by that uh, particular initiative. The next thing which I wanted to also res uh, respond to one of the issues when you talk about uh, standard having, you know, uh, economics and social and all things, but uh, as far as our understanding goes, a scheme could be. Uh, having a unique feature, or we call it as a single attribute scheme. So it necessarily doesn't mean that, you know, a standard should have all these things. Uh, it is basically a product differentiation mechanism. So uh, the scheme, it is upon the scheme owner to, you know, sell the scheme as what he wants to, rather than telling him to address all and, you know, somewhere uh, we would increase the number of schemes and, you know, lose some product differentiation uh, attempt that that particular scheme owner wants to make. Uh, the last point which I want to uh, sort of put up as a request to Angtad is, uh, you know, it is always that it started like a voluntary standard, but somewhere, you know, the term sustainability has come in, so we call it VSS. Uh, my question is, uh, has there been a sort of um, uh, a mechanism to see which all these standards are actually sustainable standards? So, you know, there could be an exercise done by Angtad to understand whether the so many standards that we call, you know, 463 um, is a figure that has come up. So is there a mechanism which Angtad could actually do as a due diligence to see whether all these standards are actually VSS or they are just standards to cater to some of these requirements which mostly are uh, commercial driven and um, to, you know, then sort of figure out what are the VSS and, you know, uh, move from the way forward from here. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes. Oh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. My name is Stanley from the Kenya Mission. I want to, my question is, uh, is closely related to what uh, the gentleman from India was asking, and it goes to Madam Natari Bresconi. Uh, what, what is the tentative current uh, share or impact of the voluntary sustainable standards to the global trade today. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other comments, questions? Yes. Yeah, call uh, me from the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Um, I think maybe we, yeah, may, probably we will come back on this issue of data. But I think uh, uh, one of the key issues we have on ATMs uh, when we track progress of the boosting and African trade, of course, it's uh, related to lack of data. But since ACTAD is uh, doing, uh, I think, great work, and Ralph also uh, have mentioned, has mentioned, I want to know your collaboration now with AUC. Um, I know they are also building with ITC uh, a trade observatory, and the trade observatory is going to help tracking progress or implementation of the African continental free trade area. So I think uh, uh, that could be something that we could consider partnering with AUC, for example, I think, so that we can also um, benefit for data that will be um, be um, collect, being collected in the context of FCFT, and this will enrich also the database. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you very much. Any other comments? No? Um, I'd like to thank India for their um, intervention. I, I do agree that the, there should be a mechanism to track whether these are actually sustainability standards or not. Um, I'm not sure who determines that they're sustainability standards. So I presume the sustainability would be measured according to the SDGs and whether they actually are aimed at meeting that or if they're simply uh, mechanisms to increase protectionism. So that's certainly something that we can look at um, from the perspective of, of UNCTAD. Um, the other issue that was raised with respect to whether we have a measurement of the impact of, of VSS on global trade, I don't think that we have done that as yet, have we? Uh, we can certainly look at it um, and see, but that would be directly linked, of course, to whether these VSS are really uh, sustainability standards. And then secondly, what has been the impact on, on global trade? Um, I, I think anecdotally we can say that the impact on certain developing countries, particularly small developing countries, is going to be negative. Um, but it would be good to have the numbers because, as you said, data matters. And uh, certainly if we have the numbers, then it can inform policy making and also negotiations in the wider framework of of the different uh, agreements that we're engaging in. Um, on the issue of, of the trade observatory, we are working with ITC on, on the global trade help desk as well as working on the trade observatory. So um, yes, we will continue to work on helping uh, collect the data on that. We also have just um, been approved to work on a program for the free trade, uh, continental free trade area of Africa um, to collect NTNs and uh, work on a program for that. So we're looking forward to doing that, and I think that that will provide the kind of data set that's necessary to assist the negotiations. Um, any other comments? Just. Thank you, Pamela. I, I wanted to uh, add to what you have said and, um, and uh, say that uh, what um, Manesh from India had said about sustainability standards and SDG is indeed a very critical point. We need to look at it. Why we call them voluntary sustainable standards. And uh, uh, I think we are going to have a discussion, as I mentioned, on Thursday, in which we undertook um, a report as the United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards. We undertook a, a report on um, on uh, on. Uh, on trade, sustain, uh, VSS, and SDGs. And this is a first cut. So we're trying to look at uh, what exists in terms of VSS, how they interface with the imp imp impact on international trade, and, and how that intends imp as an impact on SDGs. Whether the goals that they are set, the environmental goals or the economic goals or the social goals identified in those standards are actually realized in the outcome of the application of the standards. So I think we, uh, we've done this short analysis and uh, it, it's, it was very interesting to see and we'll be presenting the report. So I will not present the report now, but we'll, we'll have the, this report on, on uh, the, this, is the th this is the third flagship report of the uh, United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards. So we will have a look at that. So you're right, we need to delve into it in depth, but we have begin the process of looking at that because we need to see if the end goals, uh, uh, the, the change in terms of the st standards, it's not the standards that are important, it's whether livelihoods have been changed and in incomes have been improved. That is uh, what we want to seek. And I think this is what uh, uh, we are trying to look at in this report. Um, the imp as the director said, I think in terms of the impact, yeah, we haven't done an uh, assessment on the impact overall of the standards. We know how many they are, and uh, they're increasing, and they're proliferating, and, and, and producers are complying with them to reach out, but we have not done an impact yet. But we've seen that it's, um, there's a phenomenal growth in this, uh, in, as, as was mentioned, you know, in, in, in the standards. And uh, there is a reason why this is growing, and uh, the reason is they're responding to consumers and uh, to, to, the, to the goals. So I think there is a reason why it's growing phenomenally. And we've seen, for example, in the growth of uh, organics, it's a phenomenal explosion of, uh, of demand for organic products. And, and, and it comes with that. It's no longer a niche market now. It's more, it's like a mainstream market. 
you go to the shops and people say, I want to go and buy organics. Uh, and they, they go to the organic shelf. They don't want to look at the standard. They go to the shelf. And this is the organic shelf, and we buy from that shelf. Uh, we don't look whether it's Swiss organic or it's, uh, you know, label the European organic standard, or is it the Ugandan organic uh, label or the East African organic standard. So there is, um, they, they, what I'm saying is the consumer is aware and is demanding organic products, so there is a, there, there is a huge, uh, uh, the, the, the industry is responding. And, the, and the, 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 there is some statistics and figure on the, in the growth of the organics market. I don't have it with me right now, but uh, I've seen that. Uh, as the, on, the, um, on the ECA, as the director has mentioned, we are, yes, we are working with, uh, with uh, AUC, the African Union Commission on, um, on, on implementing the African continental free trade area, and uh, we, we will be looking in particular at the um, non-tariff measures annex that they are developing, so finalizing the annex, and then uh, the, so the, the, regular, the rules, uh, uh, and then looking at to how data, they can start collecting the data, making it available, it's very interesting here because, um, like what Aladi said, in the um, African context, um, the idea is to increase transparency on the barriers across the continent, uh, not the barriers, the non-tariff measures across the continent. So increase transparency on those non-tariff measures, and then look at regulatory cooperation among governments. So reduce the regulatory dispersion we would like to work with them to reduce it so that there is greater coherence in terms of the regulation, so they become less of a barrier, uh, less of a um, compliance mechanism to comply per country's regula regulation. If the regulations are similar, it's, it's easier to comply across countries. So we are working increasing transparency with a view to enhancing uh, awareness across the continent, as well as um, there are those barriers which may, there are those measures which may be actually barriers, and the private mm -hmm. sector encounters those barriers when they are actually crossing the border, and when they meet the customs official, and the customs official says, "No, no, you can't because you have not met this TBT or SPS, or uh, you have not met the certificate," and they raise an issue, and then when that when that uh, when that product cannot cross the border, and the issue is raised. As you said, Director, where do you go? What are the options in terms of communicating your complaint? Where does the trader go to communicate its complaint? What happens to the and what happens to the complaint? So we are trying to work uh, with uh, we are working it uh, in the tripartite region, which we would like to bring this uh, idea to the continental region in that those measures which are encountered as barriers at the borders there is a place for them to be dealt with in an intergovernmental setting. So the barriers are identified, they are, they are then notified to a kind of a mechanism which then takes, is taken up at the intergovernmental level, the level of governments, to then address the removal of that particular barrier. So it is looking at removing NTBs, so, you, so you, you have a system in place. So this is what we would like to work at, and we think that this is something that other regional organizations could be interested in as well, because there are certain NTMs which then become barriers, and how do you address the barriers? Where do you go? Where do you complain? Who, takes the, who then responds to the uh, complaints, and who looks into removing them or addressing them? So um, such a system would be also very useful in terms of dealing with the uh, NTBs, and as the director mentioned, we would like to work with the... Um, the uh, African Union Commission, ECA as well, uh, and through our Africa office uh, to, uh, to you know, collaborate on this. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Sorry, back here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, come back to the impact of, of sustainability standards. And just starting on the impact on sustainability issues, even there, there is not that much evidence on the actual impact on the ground. So what we've been able to analyze is very much uh, the issues relating to looking at the different requirements in the different standards. And so you can look at that. But 
what the impact is actually on the ground, there is very little uh, study in that area. And uh, what we saw uh, from a, a recent report from uh, June uh, by Oxfam, which is called Ripe for Change, uh, they actually really demonstrate the uh, declining power of the producers vis-a-vis -vis the expanding and increasing power of, of, of supermarkets. So those are issues that are really important that need to be uh, studied in more detail. And if we look at the impact on trade, um, I think that the impacts will be not so different from other non-tariff measures, except that you have a different entity setting the standard. You don't have a government setting it, but you have very powerful entities setting the standard. So the impact in the end uh, on trade will not be very, very different, I think. And to some extent, it's even harder uh, to, to understand because we have this multitude of standards, plus you have very little data. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, you can see the trade in products and, and, and so forth, but the actual production of, uh, of sustainability pro products and the consumption, um, even less, is, it's very hard to monitor and understand. So uh, it, it will be a challenge to actually really understand the market distorting effect of, of, uh, of, of, these, of these standards, but it can't be very different in terms of the logic than a, a mandatory standard. Thank you very much. Um, any further comments? Well, let me take this opportunity to thank the panel very much for your interventions. Thank you for your questions and your engagement. Um, we have two more, three more days, <laughs> a whole week. So, <laughs> um, so I, I'm afraid I won't be with you because I have to travel, uh, but I am sure that this will continue to be a very engaging process. And um, this is a critical issue. I like the comments and the recommendations that have been made. I think that it's important work for us to do in terms of analyzing, collecting the data, and seeing what the impact is on global trade, also the impact on gender. Um, the level of protectionism, I am very concerned about what you last raised, about the issue of it not being as easily governable. Because the issue is if it's private, if it's voluntary, then it's hard to, to control and to measure. And I think that that's something that we need to be very careful about and to see how we can help countries navigate this new paradigm. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Bonapas, did you want to say anything no, to close? No, okay. Back, come back we'll back. come back at 3 o'clock. Is that yes. it? Yes, we'll be back at 3 o'clock. No? Oh, they, they, oh sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, staff to wants to say five, five minutes. To, to five minutes. Okay. To thank you. Mijo, sorry. Ralph and Miho, sorry. Let me just um, thank you very much indeed. All these are the excellent um, the points that you have raised. May I just add something on the sustainability standards, um, which the third day will be on voluntary sustainability standards or VSS, uh, which are often called like uh, eco labels on the products. Um, there was an extremely interesting, important question on how much do we know about the market impact. As you said, it's very difficult to sort of get the figure of the kind of, at the global level, what would be the impact of, you know, what's the market share of the sustainability products in the global trade. So we studied local. We called uh, the UN cafeteria, Eldra, <laughs> and asked how much of the, you know, products you, you buy which carry the sustainability standards. They said that, you know, after this session, if you go to a cafeteria, you find uh, fair trade bananas, coffee uh, certified woods, fresh fruits and vegetables certified organic. They really want to say that they really care about the sustainability standards. But in fact, this is really not about the local level. Every global value chain website, you, check, you click and it says there are sustainable value chains. So it has become very much kind of mainstreamed. But uh, then how do VSS actually affect producers? I think this is really the thing that we really care, especially at Anctad, 
we are really seeing this issue from this, you know, like a small producer's point of view. Like producers can choose or sometimes told to, you know, use which, to, to which VSS to follow. And they have to transform their production practice accordingly. And then they should be certified that they, mm -hmm. add, you know, their production actually comply with the chosen VSS. And this is how this VSS is taken at or framed as a kind of market access issue, especially for small producers or non-tariff measures. Now, eminent producers uh, and speakers have already sort of elaborated so clearly about the key challenges. But I think it's the thing is that VSS actually highlight the challenges regarding the fairness of the global value chain. It's basically about uh, the, the market power imbalance within sustainable value chains. We all know or we all hear about the smiley curve in the value chain that actually the producers or manufacturers receive the smallest share of the profits. We fear that in sustainable or sustainability value chain, this could be even worse. Not only that they receive a very small share of the profits, but often this is the producers which have to bear all the costs associated with VSS, starting from transforming their production process and also certifying for the VSS. And we find this is extremely a big, big challenge that we have to tackle. You have said, and many people actually say, that VSS have a great potential to become an effective tool to you know, help developing countries achieve the SDGs. And we really hope that this, one day this day comes true, this day comes, but at this moment, this is not really happening. And that's why on the third day, on Thursday, we will be discussing this, how we can do, what we can do to make VSS better contribute to the SDGs. Thank you. Ah, okay, just one more oh. thing. One more thing, the important thing that you said that there are not so many country studies that, you know, from the field about this impact of VSS. And this is why our project, UNCTAD's project called Fostering Green Exports Through VSS, we sent people to the ground and then asked them, you know, them to interview producers to assess their preparedness to uh, this sustainable growth, dynamic growth of the sustainable value chains. We wanted to check how much they know about organic standards, sustainability standards, and how much they think they're prepared for it. And on, the third, on Thursday, we will be uh, presenting the preliminary results of these studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miho. Thanks. Um, okay, so we'll resume at three o'clock. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ralph, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Ralph, please go ahead. It was, sorry, um, Chair, maybe, uh, I mean, I also wanted to very, give a very quick overview of the, um, of the uh, next one and a half days. And uh, uh, in the non-tariff measures program, uh, we normally have a chain of activities, so we start with uh, what are non-tariff measures. Um, and uh, this is not, not straightforward. It's very clear anti-dumping, non-automatic licenses are non-tariff measures. But then we have heard a lot about SPS, TBT. So if we take the de definition like all policy measures that can have an impact on trade, there are many behind the border measures. And uh, there is the question like how far do we go? What do we include in this um, universe. So we start with this one, then we collect the data. It has been mentioned that uh, there is a, a significant effort undergone um, to collect the data and to map those non-tariff measures. Then we disseminate those data. Based on the data, we undertake research and analysis. Uh, Alessandro will say a few words about this. And then we uh, ultimately, of course, use this to support better policy making. Um, in this uh, next one and a half days, focusing on uh, non-tariff measures, we take the reverse order. So we start in the afternoon with uh, two very interesting sessions. Um, the first looking at uh, national perspectives, national in uh, approaches to design good regulations and to do streamlining of existing non-tariff measures. So we will hear from Malaysia, Rwanda, Brazil, and from the OECD. Um, how they 
how countries can design good regulations or existing regulations um, streamline them. Uh, we have heard that it is extremely important because of value chains. Also, the director mentioned already exporting uh, goods faces a lot of measures in the country itself. So it's very important here to um, to have a clear, um, you know, clear clear policies um, to do this. And uh, we will hear about uh, some concrete approaches here. Um, but even if we have good regulations at the national level, uh, there are still costs uh, related to non-tariff measures. And those are often uh, coming from uh, the fact that those regulations are very different. So we know, for example, um, Asian car producers, they have two different assembly lines, one producing cars for the EU, one producing cars for the United States, because some cables have to be yellow, some have to be red or so, and there are so many uh, nitty-gritty details. Um, and exporting to countries at a similar level of development, but still the regulations are so difficult and so different, and we know this from the TTIP negotiations, that it's very difficult also here to come together and to, to try to harmonize those. Um, but we'll hear from some approaches at the um, regional level and at the multilateral level to, to address those issues. And we have here um, the WTO, of course, a very important player. We have the SPS, TBT committees, and we have a representative here, the chair of the um, SPS um, uh, uh, committee. We um, have uh, guests from SADC uh, to, to speak about regional efforts there, um, from FAO um, to also report about um, a, a multilateral standard setting bodies like the Codex Alimentarius, what are the efforts there to come up with, with global standards. And again, we have the OECD. Um, the session is chaired by um, the um, uh, STDF, which is supporting governments and private sector to facilitate SPS capacity gaps. Um, to overcome these capacity gaps. So that is a session um, on, on um, regulatory cooperation. Um, this is based on research. So tomorrow morning we have a, a research session where we bring together researchers and policymakers, um, where we have uh, a session chaired by Ellen Winters, who is one of the father of the modern approaches uh, to, to look at non-tariff measures. Um, and we have two reports that will be re um, shown tomorrow. One uh, will be um, mentioned by Alessandro, and uh, another report, it's a joint effort by World Bank and UNCTAD. Um, also, we have uh, our colleagues from um, the Economic Commissions, the uh, United Nations Economic Commissions, um, tomorrow making linkages to trade facilitation, trade costs, and regional integration in their respective regions. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to very briefly thank ESCAP because um, to you know, um, clarify the issue with interpretation, um, ESCAP is supporting the interpretation into Russian because they have a group from uh, Central Asia, in fact, here. Um, so we did book uh, Russian uh, interpretation and thanks for French as a courtesy. Uh, then this research is based on data so we will show um, how the data um, is uh, disseminated, and there are, uh, I believe, four main global portals in addition to uh, regional efforts, and that is the WITS uh, uh, by World Bank and, and uh, uh, Partners, um, TRAINS, ITIP from the WTO, and a new um, uh, effort by ITC, W and UNCTAD to um, have uh, the information easier accessible for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, the, the data is uh, based on data collection, and this is based on, uh, on having a common language. So the classification that we uh, use um, that has been developed uh, together by UNCTAD with um, the FAO, ITC, World Bank, WTO, OECD, and UNIDO um, is really the backbone of all this transparency efforts. And uh, we are doing some, some efforts to uh, revise the classification. So we have added now, or we are going to add chapters on rules of origin, intellectual property, government procurement, subsidies, 
and restrictions on post-sale services. So we are extending uh, the current classification to cover the remaining um, uh, issues and to develop a taxonomy on this. Um, to conclude, uh, our efforts um, on, on the, the classification and the data collection, uh, which is a huge effort because we read hundreds of thousands of pages and code them into, into the non-tariff measures and into products, um, this is really a collective effort uh, together with uh, many partners, 17. Um, so we have the African Development Bank uh, with the Regional Economic Commission, SADEC, COMESA, EAC, and ECOVAS, um, the Latin American Integration Association, ALADI. Uh, we have the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, AREA, with whom we work very closely in ASEAN, um, ITC, GRIPS, the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Japan, um, UNECE, World Bank, WTO, UNSCAP, IMF, FAO, OECD, and UNIDO. So it's really a, a global effort um, to advance the agenda on transparency and, uh, and, and then using this for research and supporting policymakers. Uh, thank you. Does it work? Yeah. Um, okay, let just let, uh, before lunch, just let me um, just tell you three points where a research can inform the policy making process. And the first point I would like to make is that uh, uh, there are a lot of NTMs out there, and this was not clear until a few years ago. So it's thanks to the effort of UNCTAD, to the WTO, to ITC, which actually went out there and trying to understand better the kind of of measures which are there, not only those institutions, but also private entities, uh, uh, including um, the, the Global Trade Alert, for, a, for, a, for example. Because of, this, of those efforts, now we know a lot more than just a few years ago about the type of policy which are there which influence international trade. Now, uh, one point that actually happens all, uh, at all the conference about NTM, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to, or most of them at least, is that the, uh, the, the, top, uh, the focus uh, becomes uh, on standards. Standards are very important, but are not the only type of NTM. And the reason why they are important is that actually when uh, what the researchers say is that Standards are very, very important for low-income countries, probably are the most important NTMs in terms of market uh, access. But when, uh, for middle-income countries and for developed countries, that's not anymore the case. It becomes other type of NTMs it be becomes much more um, important, and this is what actually we are observing now in terms of trade uh, friction between the, the main uh, develop and emerging markets. So those are not about standards, but about other types of NTM. So when we talk about NTMs, it's important to remember which is not only about standards, but it's also all sorts of other measures which influence international trade and, and the domestic uh, economy influence international trade. So the second point I would like to make is that uh, the costs associated with NTMs are not trivial. In, in, uh, there are quite a bit of estimates out there, and uh, I would say the ballpark number is about 10%. So they add about to the cost of trade about 10% uh, on average. Of course, this may not seem like a, a large number if you consider that where the average trade, uh, the tariff, uh, uh, it's about half of it, a little less. But what is important, as in the case of tariff, actually, that if, if they can be very I in specific case, in specific products, especially in agriculture, uh, the costs associated with NTMs are much higher, in some, in some cases even higher than 40%. So uh, that's, uh, that's another argument. Now you can answer to that, yes, but those costs are actually justified because it's mostly related to standards, the standards are there for a good reason, and that's true. But also what the re research shows, and that's what also came out of the, of the discussion the, the, this morning, is that those costs are quite asymmetric. So they, uh, they, 
they they are different across different agents uh, operating in this market. So in general, what research find is that they are generally higher for low-income countries, they are generally higher for small and medium enterprises, and they are generally higher for uh, for for gen for for female-headed uh, enterprise and, and 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 things like that. The reason why is that uh, there is an reason which was uh, mentioned this morning, like, which is very important, is like the presence or not presence of the quality uh, infrastructure, which is quite important in the case of standards, but also in the case, be, be, because standards are generally not, uh, um, especially in relation to the developed market, are not really negotiated. They are imposed by markets and, and countries need to oblige to them if they want to export. So there is not much of, an, of, of a negotiation and the voice of developing countries is not as, ma as strong as it should be, as, also in case of international standards. In relation to this point, I think it's quite important the, 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 the argument which was made about multinationals or like global value, value, value chain, because what research shows is actually that uh, standards act as a, uh, they do segment market and, and they act as a high uh, barrier to entry. So small and medium enterprise cannot access the market easily when there are a lot of standards there. So, um, and this goes into the, the debate about uh, the market segmentation and competitive uh, behavior of large firms and who actually pays for those standards. Is that the small producers, they are being uh, not so much, they're not bene benefit as much from those standards which in theory are, um, should help them, especially in the case of voluntary sustainability standards. And, uh, or are the big multinational which are the standard setting and which actually set the, vo the voluntary standards and probably have a high voice in setting the, internet, the government standards. So that's something which uh, uh, research is looking at and it should be looked even more. Um, last point I want to make is that uh, the issues related to policy substitution and preference erosion. You know, we know very well preference erosion, but policy, so with policy sub, sub, substitution, we intend the, the, the fact that when country exceed the WTO, when country reduce tariff, they may be tempted to replace the protection given by those tariffs by other form of non-tariff measure. And this, and this is actually what has happened in the past and still happening. We see that there is, in many cases, a lot of policy substitution is driven by a political economy uh, environment, but this is what's happening. So this feeds into the preference erosion because tariffs are going down, but now there are those other types of measures for which there is not real pre uh, preference. So one question that we are being asked as policy, uh, inf I mean, as policy makers probably as, as a researcher is that how can preferential scheme be adapted to, this, to those new forms of trade policy? And, there is, and, the, and the answer to this is not really easy. What, what we can see from research is that preferential uh, schemes are not, uh, uh, are valuable as, as they were like 20 years ago or 10 years ago even. And what we see is that technical assistance prog uh, programs and export promotion agency are very, very valuable in this to try to, to, to be able to overcome those uh, costs of NTM. So the, the policy prescription there would be if you're going to, um, to sign up an agreement with the EU or with the US or with uh, Japan or with even with China, make sure that uh, in the agreement there is some technical assistance uh, project integrated in the, in the, in the agreement. And, um, and I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I really like that last point about making sure that the preferential agreements would incorporate some kind of technical assistance because we've seen it. Uh, preferential agreements don't necessarily mean increased market access if you can't take advantage of the provisions. Um, so uh, I can close now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll see you at 3 o'clock.